We are live in the River Valley Room. Good morning and welcome to the Community and Public Service Committee meeting for January 15th, 2024. Happy New Year, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order and I would like to start with the land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and the Métis homelands and acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. And now I would like to pass it over to Clerk Kar Karbashewski and uh, please to uh, with a, an emergency message. Thank you, Chair Principe. Uh, as the meeting manager for the Community and, and Public Services Committee meeting today, I um, have to go over the emergency response and evacuation procedures for this room. In the event of an emergency, everyone must evacuate through the nearest safe exit. Those seated in the gallery take direction from security to evacuate. Council takes direction from myself. After evacuating the room, please proceed to the nearest building exit. Do not take an elevator or walk through City Hall. Persons with limited mobility must immediately, with the aid of a monitor, proceed to the closest exit. Monitors for the persons with limited mobility will remain with them during an evacuation. The fire department will evacuate the persons with limited mo mobility from the building. Finally, please speak with the security guard or myself if you require first aid at any point during the meeting. Thank you. Thank you for that message. Uh, next, we'll do a roll call. Uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, good morning. Happy New Year. Good morning. Happy New Year. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Mayor. Uh, and in person here, we have Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Good morning. Online, uh, Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Jans. Good morning. Good morning. And I don't see any other councillors on right now. Uh, if you are there, please let me know. All right. Next, we'll move uh, to adoption of the agenda. Councillor Rice, would you like to do that? Um, yes, uh, I would like to move uh, that is January 15, 2024, Community and the Public Services Committee meeting agenda be adopted with the following change. Uh, replacement attachments 7.1 uh, updated affordable housing uh, strategy attachment one. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Any questions on the agenda? Please vote. Uh, I'm yes. I'm trying to vote, so I'm just going to vote verbally yes. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Next, we'll move to approval of the minutes. Councillor Knack? Uh, yes, thank you. I'm happy to move the approval of the minutes from the December 4th, 2023 Community and Public Services meeting. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Do we have any questions, uh, concerns, omissions? No? Okay, please vote on approval of the minutes. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Uh, I do not see any protocol items. I do not believe we have any. Uh, next, we will select items for debate. I'll ask my colleagues to sign up to select items for debate.
Councillor Paquette, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, happy to select uh, items 7.1 and 7.2. Thank you. All items have been selected, so no, uh, no need to vote on items not selected for debate. Request to speak. Councillor Paquette? Yes, we have uh, a number of people signed up to speak on 7.1. We've got Joshua Evans uh, from Affordable Housing Solutions Lab in person, I believe. Yep, okay. Uh, we've got Candace Noble from the Bissell Center. Yep. Uh, we've got Susan McGee to answer questions only, remote. Katie Savanto, uh, the Premier's Council on the Status of Persons with Disabilities to answer questions only, in person. Um, we also have Louis Francescuti, uh, remote, and Lena Awad from the Islamic Family Remote, Omar Yacoub, Islamic Family Remote, and Laura Cunningham Shpeli, Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues Remote. We also have Chris Beasley, uh, University of Alberta U Students Union in person, I believe. Yep, okay, and uh, Bavesh. Uh, Upadye from the Tribal Chiefs Ventures Incorporated uh, remote. We've also got Bree Claude from Savidia remote, uh, Gord Johnson from Savidia remote, Hannah Bain, Climate Justice Edmonton remote, Robert Tate in person, maybe on his way, and Jeannie uh, Van de Kerkhove, Solas in person. And Cheyenne Miko uh, Kihu from Edmonton Two Spirit Society in person. And on 7.2, we've got Shannon Watson in person. And that is the sum total. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, I will ask my colleagues to please vote on hearing from this. Oh, we don't have to do that at committee. Sorry. We're actually very happy to hear from our speakers at committee, so thanks for being here today. Oh, actually, we do vote on it. See, yeah, new year, have to get back into the swing of things. All right, so well, how about if we vote on that now then, please? We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Uh, request for time specific on agenda, none. Councillor inquiries, none. Reports to be dealt with at a different meeting, none. Request to reschedule reports, none. Unfinished business, none. We are on to public reports. I'd just like to say that Mayor Sohi has joined us and Councillor Tang has joined us. So we will go on to item 7.1 at this time. And I would like to ask administration if they have a presentation for us. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Flam and I'm the Deputy City Manager for Community Services with the City of Edmonton. We are here today to request committee's recommendation to council for a decision on the city's updated affordable housing strategy. I'm joined by Crystal Kujenner, Director of Affordable Housing and Homelessness, and Hanny Kwan, Manager Housing Policy and Partnerships. The updated affordable housing strategy builds on our record of success in addressing the housing challenges of Edmontonians who are living in core housing need and who cannot afford market housing. The updated strategy focuses on the City of Edmonton's actions to increase the overall supply of affordable housing in Edmonton. These efforts, these efforts are, of course, intertwined with many other works uh, of areas of work that the City is doing, including our role in regulating and supporting market housing development, our work around safety, community safety and well-being, and our contributions to the broader community effort to reduce and eliminate homelessness. 
it isn't possible to incorporate all of the city's wide breadth of related and relevant work into a single document. The updated affordable strategy is meant to serve as a guiding document over the next few years for the city's efforts to reduce core housing need through the increased provision of non-market or affordable housing. It is also aligned with the forthcoming corporate homelessness plan and community plan to end homelessness this spring, as well as the city's housing accelerator fund action plan, which is expected to be confirmed in the coming weeks and will bring greater clarity around easing the delivery of market housing supply. In addition, the updated affordable housing strategy aligns with the city's community safety and well-being strategy and incorporates the recommendations from the Indigenous affordable housing strategy work. Crystal and Hanny will now share more of the details of what to expect with the updated strategy. Over to you, Crystal. Uh, thanks, Jen, and good morning, members of Community and Public Services Committee and the rest of Council. Um, the city's first affordable housing strategy was launched in 2016 and intended to carry us through to 2025. The strategy informed the city's first affordable housing investment plan in 2018 and helped to establish Edmonton as a leader among Canadian cities for affordable housing development. By acting as an early investor and providing city-owned land and development expertise, we surpassed our original goals and, crea and created more affordable housing between 2019 and 2022 than in the previous decade. While this strategy was not set to expire until 2025, administration began the process of refreshing the strategy in late 2022 to better account for a number of factors that have changed and evolved since the 2016 strategy was drafted. These include new data and methodologies for estimating core housing need, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Edmontonians, changing priorities and opportunities um, from other orders of government, and the expanding role of the city in the affordable housing ecosystem. The City of Edmonton is already very active in the affordable housing ecosystem in Edmonton. We provide significant grant funding and we make land available at nominal cost for affordable housing projects. Affordable housing in Edmonton is no longer required to pay the municipal portion of property taxes thanks to the city's affordable housing tax grant program, which helps providers keep rents as low as possible. We monitor and invest in research and data collection to fully understand housing need in Edmonton. We lead efforts to publicly champion affordable housing as a solution to ending poverty and an important part of a healthy community. And Edmonton has been a leader in removing regulatory barriers to housing supply. Accordingly, the updated strategy before committee today is not a radical departure from our previous efforts. Instead, the strategy reflects opportunities to increase our impact by paying attention to new dimensions of housing need and incorporates new ideas and perspectives from stakeholders and people with lived and living experience. The updated strategy provides the city with a clear and comprehensive picture of what is required to address housing need for all Edmontonians now and in the long term and will help to inform our priorities, programs and investments that we can make the best use of future funding opportunities. Next slide. The affordable housing strategy fundamentally seeks to reduce core housing need in Edmonton. A key component of the strategy is a new housing needs assessment, which has been updated with the latest 2021 census data and additional information provided by stakeholders. Attachment four contains a full assessment, but this slide highlights some of its key findings. One in eight households, or 46,155 households in Edmonton, including both owners and renters, are experiencing core housing need. That means they struggle to afford the cost of housing or live in crowded or unsafe conditions and can't afford to move. These households have to make difficult decisions between covering the costs of housing and affording other essentials like food, clothing, and transportation. Renters are four times more likely than owners to be in core housing need. Looking at renters in Edmonton, the biggest need in terms of overall population of households in core housing need is experienced by racialized households, but other demographic groups are also disproportionately impacted. 41% of senior households that rent are in housing need. While this does not constitute the highest overall number of households in core housing need, it is certainly the highest overall uh, percentage. 36% of single mothers that rent are also living in core housing need, and one in three Indigenous renter households are living in core housing need. Approximately 3,000 Edmontonians have no permanent home. Some are in temporary accommodations like couch surfing, staying in emergency shelters, or are unsheltered. Having detailed information about housing need in Edmonton ensures the city can prioritize the resources available to us to ensure they are being used to help those in the greatest need. Now I'll invite Mr. Hanny Kwan to share more information about how the strategy was developed. Hanny. Thank you, Crystal. The updated strategy was informed by a comprehensive engagement 
in-depth document reviews, a jurisdictional scan, and the affordable housing needs assessment. The various inputs are reflected on this slide. Some important insights worth mentioning include lessons from engagement with people's lived and living experience of housing need and homelessness. We heard that they want to be active participants in their housing journey. They want direct relationships with decision makers. That location of housing is important and in particular proximity to transit. Discrimination and racism frequently act as barriers to accessing housing and additional housing supports are needed such as mental health, addiction, financial literacy and other supports. Feedback from the affordable housing and social services sector on what worked and did not work in the 2016 strategy resulted in suggestions to increase funding, strengthen partnerships, and diversify design, such as creating units designed for larger families, particularly newcomers. Feedback from the public showed a desire for increased support services for people once housed, um, increased affordable housing supply, and increased homelessness prevention services. 75.5% of Edmontonians agreed that affordable housing makes Edmonton a better place to live, and nearly 70% said it would make it a safer city. Additionally, nearly 85% of Edmontonians believed that some families could not find affordable housing that was suitable for their size and needs. All of this input was taken into consideration when drafting the guiding principles, the goals, and objectives in the updated strategy. This feedback will also continue to guide how the strategy is implemented and how we do our work. Based on these inputs, <coughs> We're confident that the updated strategy outlines an approach that responds to housing need, is supported by stakeholders, and is achievable. Next slide, please. As Crystal mentioned, the updated strategy builds on our current approach to addressing core housing need in Edmonton, and also reflects the lessons we've learned, partic particularly over the last four years. That is, the need to be agile and adaptable to unforeseen challenges and responsive to new and emerging opportunities. The updated strategy contains three overarching goals, shown on the slide here, which are based on all the inputs to the updated strategy and are critical to meeting the housing need in Edmonton. Each goal is broken down into objectives, seven in total, which are designed to help us achieve these goals accompanied by 15 action-oriented tactics that each contain several key actions that we can take to achieve our objectives and goals. All, the de all of the details can be found in the implementation plan of the updated strategy, and this strategy framework is designed to inform our work plan going forward while also allowing the city to adapt and be responsive to emergent conditions and opportunities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the strategy includes 52 actions. This slide highlights some examples of the key actions that can be expected from the updated strategy. Some of the actions that are new for us include the imminent corporate homelessness plan, an accessible housing strategy, a 10-year acquisition framework, enhancing supports for renters, supporting the expansion of bridge and trans transitional housing, and investigating creative alternative financing options for affordable housing. We will also continue to do what we know works, including maximizing the use of public lands, providing grants, supporting housing providers with project development, focusing on indigenous-led solutions, supporting and supporting co-op housing, and regularly engaging with all stakeholders in the, del in the delivery of affordable housing. Next slide, please. Given the depth of need, it is important to recognize that there are, are actions that we will need help with, particularly from other orders of government and our partners. The city is only one actor in the ecosystem and our resources and jurisdictional constraints will simply not be enough to address all of these actions. We will need to work very closely with the provincial and federal governments on increasing the funding and land contributions for affordable housing, increasing and delivering the comprehensive support services that are needed, aligning and coordinating programs, sharing and providing robust data and reporting, along with other actions noted on this slide, if the collective effort is to be successful. I'll now hand it back over to Ms. Gajener to take you through the strategy's targets. Thanks, Henny. The updated strategy includes a set of initial medium and long-term targets based on the inputs to date and reflecting our current commitments. The updated strategy allows us to adapt these targets as new information and conditions shift and emerge over time. Ongoing work will likely be needed to accurately determine the city's contributions to achieving these targets based on regular budget cycle decisions and opportunities. Some familiar medium tar targets to be achieved by 2026 include adding 2,700 units of affordable housing, the development of initial targets required a balance between recognizing the current economic climate and the ability to respond to new opportunities and the priorities identified in the needs assessment. Long-term targets integrate the city plan vision of no one being in core housing need and an end to chronic and episodic homelessness by 2020 or 2050. Targets may also change 
depending on the outcomes of the upcoming plan, community plan to prevent and end homelessness and the corporate homelessness plan to ensure consistency, alignment, and relevance. Next slide. The updated strategy also includes plans for a robust monitoring and evaluation framework, which will measure and report on the city's progress and performance. This includes a public-facing dashboard, which along with the housing needs assessment will be updated every two years. The framework also includes sharing data and information on trends in the external housing environment, such as CMHC reports on the rental market, to ensure the strategy remains relevant to the dynamic and shifting needs it was designed to address. In support of alignment and collaboration efforts, research and engagement findings will be shared with partners regularly to improve cross-sector planning and capacity. Next slide, please. If the updated affordable housing strategy is approved, this will provide administration with a roadmap to guide our actions going forward to help us meet our housing goals. It is important to note the relationship between the updated strategy and the forthcoming community plan to prevent and end homelessness, the corporate homelessness plan, and the housing accelerator fund action plan. Together, these will all form the foundation for the work on affordable housing and homelessness in the coming years. The updated affordable housing strategy provides the roadmap for how the city will respond to core housing need through increased housing supply, amplified by the Housing Accelerator Fund's action plans, effort, action plans efforts on both market and non-market housing. In addition, the strategy incorporates the recommendations from the 2022 Indigenous Affordable Housing Strategy and maintains the Affordable Housing Investment Plan as its primary mechanism for supporting affordable housing development. The updated strategy also provides the roadmap for how the city will address homelessness with the corporate homelessness plan being the key tactic. The corporate plan will identify how city resources need to be prioritized to respond to both the growing need for services and connections to housing with consideration of the roles of other organizations and levels of government. The corporate plan will bring clarity to the city's role in homelessness resolution, especially as it relates to unsheltered homelessness and also will outline actions to develop a robust homelessness prevention portfolio, which will help people at risk of homelessness to retain their housing. The updated community plan to prevent and end homelessness is led by Homer Trust and will provide a full accounting of what Edmonton as a community needs to prevent and end homelessness. That includes the number of and type of emergency shelter spaces, as well as housing supports specific to different types of supportive housing. What council can expect to see immediately if the strategy is approved is the launch of the affordable housing dashboard, the continued marshalling of resources to implement the Housing Accelerator Fund Action Plan, and continued forward movement, movement on creating a pipeline of new and better and more shovel-ready projects to leverage funding from other orders of government and housing providers an approach that has already proven to be successful over the past four years. And with that, we conclude our presentation um, and we'd be happy to answer questions after the speakers. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. So I will ask administration to please have a seat in the back and then we will uh, invite our speakers here today to come forward, please. Joshua Evans, the clerk will guide you to your seat. You can come on up. Candace Noble, and then we have Susan McGee would be next. She's online. Katie Savanto. Katie, are you here? Not yet. Uh, and then we have uh, Dr. French Guti. He's remote. Uh, Lena Awad is remote. Omar Yakub is remote. Laura cunningham Spelly is remote. Chris Beasley, can you come on up forward? Quinn Wade. And Bavesh, up, yes. he's online. Hi there, we'll call you soon. Bree Cloud is online. Gore Johnson is online. Oh. Katie, I see you're online. You'll be speaking online. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hannah Bain is remote. Robert Tate, are you here or online? Okay, thank you. He may come out later. Uh, Jeannie Vender Kerhoof. In person, great, come on up. Well, we fit everyone on uh, the panel. The clerk will guide you to your seat. 
so I'm just going to go over how uh, the procedure of how we hear from speakers. So we're really happy to have you here today. For each item, administration uh, may uh, provide uh, opening remarks, which they did. Oh, oh yeah, Cheyenne, sorry. Sorry about that, Cheyenne. Come on forward. Speakers will be heard in panels and each speaker will have five minutes to present. The clerk will run the official timer in council chamber. The timer lights on the podiums will be green for the first four minutes, turn yellow when there is one minute remaining and flash red when the five minutes are up. If you are participating virtually, you may wish to use your a timer of your own. When everyone in your panel has had a chance to present, members of council may ask questions of you or other panel members. For this reason, you may wish to remain in the meeting until all questions have been asked of your panel. If you are participating virtually, please remember to mute your microphone when you are not speaking and refrain from using the raise hand function as it creates issues of fairness and decorum. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please reach out to the office of the city clerk using the contact information provided in your confirmation of registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. If you are here with us in person, the clerk will guide you to the of Alberta. For the last four years, I've been leading the Affordable Housing Solutions Lab. I'm here to speak in support of the revised affordable housing strategy. After several years of researching issues of housing affordability and affordable housing more specifically, my overarching realization is this. Our city is at a turning point in two fundamental ways. First, we have returned to levels of homelessness witnessed in 2008. We are currently facing a crisis that demands immediate action from all levels of government. Rather than respond with resignation, we must focus on the systemic causes and respond with permanent solutions. Housing is absolutely essential to solving the crisis of houselessness in our city. Moreover, a complete reassessment and reworking of our emergency shelter approach is warranted. Will we continue with this emergency response merry-go-round or can we develop a housing system that prevents houselessness? Second turning point, Edmonton is widely perceived as an affordable city. To date, we've been relatively insulated from skyrocketing housing costs experienced in places such as Toronto and Vancouver. However, over the past two years, many tenants have experienced rent increases. Moreover, as the population has grown, the demand for housing is increasing. Will we go the way of Vancouver or Toronto, cities with the most unaffordable housing in Canada? Or can we develop as a city while expanding and deepening housing affordability for more households, especially low-income households? In my opinion, this revised affordable housing strategy is absolutely vital to achieving both of these visions for our city. Neither one of these visions can be achieved without more affordable housing. This strategy has numerous strengths, and it is on this basis that I encourage committee members to support it. Three strengths in particular stand out to me. The strategy is data-driven. It has been developed in response to a needs assessment using re recent census data. It has calculated the current and forecasted supply gaps and used these calculations to set targets. Two, the strategy is equity-centered. It has calculated the need for priority population groups and it has centered equity seeking groups in the development of the strategy. In this regard, it could be potentially aligned with a human rights approach to housing. Third, the strategy is proactive. Not only is it organized around goals, objectives, targets, and indicators, it also details in the implement implementation plan more specific tactics and key actions. So there is substance to this strategy. The strategy also resonates with the learnings we have acquired through our work in the AHSL. In 2021, 2022, we implemented a six month social innovation lab called the Pivot to identify what actions we as a community could take to turn or pivot our housing system in a better, more equitable direction. We identified six areas of action. The first area of action identified by participants was to grow, enhance, and protect Edmonton's supply of affordable housing. I'm encouraged to see many of the same objectives in this strategy under goal number one. In particular and importantly, this strategy seeks to increase housing choice, diversify affordable housing supply, and retain existing housing, affordable housing stock. 
I like to end by drawing attention to the fact that this strategy itself is a challenge to reimagine our housing system. A needs-based affordable housing strategy seeks to calibrate our affordable housing system in accordance with the varying levels of need that exist in the community. In the past, the definition of need has been far too narrow. This strategy challenges the city of Edmonton and Edmontonians more generally to envision a housing system with a much larger proportion of affordable nonprofit housing than we might have calculated in using these more narrow definitions. Here I'm reminded of other places in the world where we do not see homelessness like Helsinki, Finland, a city roughly the same size as Edmonton, but where 17% of households live in subsidized housing. Here in Edmonton, we have roughly 4% of households who live in subsidized housing. These housing systems are different, but not because Finland has so many more low-income households. In fact, Finland has far fewer. Finland is different because they have, as a society, chosen to decommodify more of their housing stock. So thank you for your attention and the opportunity to speak here today. And thank you. Uh, next, we will go to Candace Noble. Please go ahead, you have five minutes. Good morning. Uh, uh, good morning, committee members. My name is Candace Noble. I am the Director of Housing and Outreach at Bissell Centre, and I'm sure by now this committee is tired of hearing from me. Uh, <laughs> as someone who has committed their career to housing access in our community, I'm grateful for the opportunity to affirm the proposed update uh, to the affordable housing strategy, a home for everyone. Uh, and congratulations to city administration and all collaborators involved in this development. To me, the strategy update is holistic in that it addresses all aspects of home, the physical structure, the opportunity for self-actualization, and a sense of belonging. It is inclusive of voices of lived experiences, collaborative with sector partners and other levels of government, and it leverages things within the city's control, such as land use and building incentives. Our work at Bissell Center most closely aligns with goal two of the strategy. Edmontonians have the housing supports they need this is evidenced by our ongoing commitment to the Housing First program, by our eviction foreclosure prevention program, Community Bridge, our work with the City of Edmonton to adapt the Rent Smart curriculum to create a tenant empowerment workshop, and by our recent collaboration with the City's Problem Properties Initiative where we support individuals with rehousing. Across our many programs, Bissell Center supports hundreds of people each year to secure permanent housing. In 2023, our Housing First programs housed 322 adults, 89 children. Our supportive referral program housed 67 adults and 39 children, a total of 517 individuals last year. I'd like to share some insight into the, affordable, into the affordability challenge my teams face for your consideration as this strategy moves forward. A single person, person on age in our community earns $1,787 per month or $21,444 a year. Last year, we saw rent for a one-bedroom apartment in Edmonton rise to an average of $1,209 per month, or $14,500 a year. A person living on age in a one-bedroom apartment in Edmonton would be spending 67% of their income on rent alone. Without a permanent rental supplement, these individuals that we've housed, the 517, will not retain their housing. This clearly demonstrates that there is a misalignment between basic income and rental costs that inherently make housing success un untenable. In 2023, our Community Bridge Program prevented 502 individuals from ex the experience of houselessness. Parallel to that success, so we saw a large increase in the number of households that we were unable to support with eviction prevention because their, households, their housing situation was unsustainable given the proportion of their rent to their income. Prior to Community Bridge intervention, those participants experienced an average housing cost to income ratio of 56%. Given that we are experiencing incredible population growth, a decreasing vacancy rate, and that we have over 46,000 households in core housing need, and that the by names list is at more than 300, three, uh, sorry, more than 3,000 names, the strategy aimed for 2,700 units of affordable housing in Edmonton by 2026, I think, is not ambitious enough. 
I'm sure all this, of course, is not news to you. Um, I'm here today to affirm, though, that the city isn't in this alone. We didn't arrive at this situation through one system misstep, and it will take collaboration at all jurisdictional levels, sector agencies, and community partners to come together to get out of this crisis. But it's doable. We know that the recent narrative of shelters versus encampments is merely a juxtaposition of two Band-Aid solutions. The acceleration of the strategy put forward today will result in a thriving community with a home for all. Thanks. And thank you. Uh, next, I'll just check with Susan McGee. I know she's online. Were you just to answer yep. questions only, Susan? Um, yeah, I can, I can stay and just wait for questions if you like. Uh, no, no, I just had it on my sheet that you had registered to only answer questions, but if you would like to speak for five minutes, we'd love to hear well, from you. I'll, I'll, speak, I'll speak a bit, but I'll speak for less than that. I think we've got some great speakers that are going to share some very um, kind of real day-to-day -day experience with the needs, so I'm not going to duplicate that. I, I did want to commend um, administration for this plan. Very important for Council's consideration. I also want to acknowledge that it can feel there's a bit of a cognitive dissonance with um, talking strategy and longer term plans in the middle of the crisis that we are experiencing and have, have has really been amplified in recent weeks. So with that, though, I think one of the things that uh, I really want to stress about the strategy is that it is um, and long term priorities and long term commitments and through the last uh, few years, I think we've we've come out of, uh, and they're now really recognizing the importance for both. We can't be in crisis management um, in a you know, on an ongoing basis and actually solve lo long-term systemic problems. And to quote um, W. Edwards Deming, systems are perfectly designed to get the results that it does. And and what we have in our experience right now is the manifestation of these gaps and the crisis and the lack of housing that we have has been decades of a system designed to get just that. So when we think about the affordable housing strategy and the importance of it, and the fact that it also recognizes that it does need to be fundamentally integrated with the other strategies that we will be talking about in the next upcoming months, um, I just really wanna underscore how important that is. It's um, taken us decades to get in this situation and it's going to take us more than four years to build our way out of it. Um, but I think uh, recognizing that we need kind of a dual system approach of having uh, nimble and uh, responsive strategies, but really keeping our eye on that that long term and uh, setting ourselves up for success means also other things that are referred to in the strategy, particularly in the principles about collaboration. There is a need to really build our capacity of a, of a sector to be able to deliver and manage what um, is envisioned in this strategy and needed, frankly, uh, very desperately. So the, the commitment of the city to be a mobilizer and enabler and to build that capacity and to work with the sector is also very important because there's a scaling of this work that is going to need to happen if we're to realize it in the time frame that we need in addition to the resources. And certainly I don't want to diminish that um, kind of in my comments at all. But other than I think really commending administration but stressing a couple of those points, I can be available for questions later. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Katie Suvanto. I had you registered as well for just to answer questions only. Did you ha want to make a presentation? Or speak? I can bring greetings. Yes, yeah, <laughs> please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, my name is Katie Suvanto, and I'm a member of the Premier's Council on the Status of Persons with Disabilities. Our vision is that Alberta is an inclusive and barrier-free society. Our mission is to advise on, report to, and make recommendations to the government of Alberta on matters relating to the opportunity for full and equal participation in persons with disabilities in the life of the province. Uh, we listen to opinions of the disability community, communicating to the ideas and concerns of the government of Alberta and the broader community, uh, working with governments, community organizations, and other stakeholders towards solutions. Solutions looking at accessibility, universal design, adaptable housing, affordability, inclusive communities, supportive services, transportation and accessibility, uh, consultation with disability advocates, and technical integration and educational programs. So by addressing these aspects, housing can be designed and provided in a way that meets the diverse needs of individuals with disabilities, promoting independence, community integration, and overall well-being. 
On a personal note, I fall into many of the categories that were mentioned today. I'm a First Nations single mother to a son with a disability. My hope is that anything moving forward is a collaboration of inclusion of people with disabilities in all aspects of planning. Thank you. And thank you. Next, we will go to uh, Louis Francescuti. Are you there? Are you online? Okay, uh, not hearing, so we'll uh, go to the next person and we'll call him later. Uh, Lena Awad, are you there? I am, yes, can you hear me? Hi, yeah, we sure can. Please go ahead, you have five minutes. Thank you, good morning. Uh, my name is Lena Awad. I'm joining you from Islamic Family, a multi-award winning social change organization that has been working to prevent uh, people from needing affordable housing and falling into houselessness. Um, we've been working on an affordable housing uh, project um, since 2017, and we've been leading CMHC's Halal Housing Lab um, this past year. We're asking the city to diversify the affordable housing providers that it works with, uh, and we're here to reaffirm the amendments that are proposed to the city housing strategy. We appreciate that the city is paying attention to housing and calling housing an emergency. Um, we're in a housing emergency for sure because we're, we've neglected to think about housing in a deep and meaningful way. The city plan focuses on housing for unemployed for employed Edmontonians and we need to plan for non-market housing. Uh, we've been doing a lot of this work um, where uh, we will be doing uh, the unhoused community a great disservice if we try to address these problems uh, through the same broken approach uh, that has led and maintained the problem that we're seeing now. We need to support innovation in housing, and that's part of what our organization has been focused on. The city can drive this innovation by diversifying affordable housing providers that it works with. Um, and we feel that it's essential that we fund indigenous and newcomer led housing projects um, that are better attuned to the needs of those communities. Housing is not just walls, it's a place to sleep uh, or a place to sleep. It's an uh, embodiment of the worldviews and values of the communities that need that housing. When these values are not integrated into a building, it leads to rejection, much like a mismatched organ. The Halal Housing Lab that we've been working uh, on has spent time listening to people. And we found that hospitality and welcoming guests uh, is an important and integral part that is often neglected in housing design. This means that designing for smaller bedrooms, bigger living rooms, thinking about privacy, grandparents, cousins, uh, space for prayer, uh, right at the beginning of the project before any other planning begins is really essential. We need to plan for non-market housing and we need to diversify providers that can reflect uh, the population of the city. And that's part of what our organization has been working on. The speaker following me is also from Islamic Family and we'll be addressing more of the details. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Omar Yakub. Please go ahead, you have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Lena. The city has done a good job describing the problem in the recent Edmonton Affordable Housing Needs Assessment Report. We appreciate the city's funding for affordable housing projects, but more is needed from the city. Diversifying affordable housing providers means bringing different perspectives into how housing is designed and operated. Current incentives focus on developing one to two bedroom units. These units are isolating, they neglect social connection and the basic facets of well being. In so doing, they drive people back to the street. While it's important for us to focus our attention on the unhoused, we must also work on Edmonton's other critical housing needs and prevention. The group that spends the longest time waiting for affordable housing is larger and extended families. This group spends on average three to four years waiting for housing. This means kids lack stability in critical years where it matters most. Edmonton's own numbers show that we need to build 40,000 new three plus bedroom units by 2026. That's more than the total number of one and two bedroom units combined. We would like to add our voice to what city council has been calling for, that we need to get serious on funding all types of affordable housing. We should take action now, examine our funding structures and find ways to engage new affordable housing providers. This will lead to new types of housing that are more effective, cheaper in the long run. Ask us how community can be leveraged for this. And this will ultimately help make Edmonton a better city. Thank you. And thank you. Next, we'll go to Laura Cunningham-Spelly. Are you there? 
I am here. Hi Thank there. You for the Please say hello. Good morning, Community and Public Services Committee. My name is Laura Cunningham Chapelet, and I am the Executive Director of the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues, representing 103, 163 community leagues across the city. We would like to express our support today for the updated affordable housing strategy and urge Community and Public Services Committee to adopt and implement it without delay. We would also like to encourage administration to continue with their 16% targets across the city as was identified in the original plan and ask to be included in conversations about affordable housing going forward. The glaring issues that are stemming from the insufficient availability of affordable housing in our city has reached an unprecedented level of visibility. While encampments and chronic homelessness stand out as the most overt examples of this deficiency, its repercussions extend well beyond the surface, impacting the well-being, stability, and peace of mind of numerous individuals, families, and communities across our landscape. As dedicated representatives of the vibrant and diverse communities within Edmonton, we recognize that until individuals have a dwelling to call their own and have the necessary resources and assurance to maintain that residence, their ability to connect and engage with a broader community remains hindered. We know that a sense of belonging is essential to successful housing, and we want to support that connection through building stronger bridges between new housing developments and community leagues. Expanding upon the city's current approach, which despite challenges beyond municipal control, has undeniably made a discernible impact on the lives of Edmontonian, and it has gained recognition for its effectiveness, and it is imperative. To address the ongoing crisis and uphold the expected levels of safety, opportunity and community connection for all residents, it is crucial to extend and enhance the city strategies. As collaborators with the city in identifying suitable locations for housing solutions, we urge administration to continue in their commitment to transparency and public buy-in. This pertains not only to the advantages of affordable housing, but also to the seamless integration of individu individual housing projects into existing neighborhoods. Since the inception of the affordable housing strategy, the EFCL has been dedicated to helping communities understand both the necessity and the potential inherent in affordable housing initiatives. While acknowledging that change can be upset unsettling, communities understand their role in this transformative process. However, frustration and opposition heighten when the community perceives exclusion from de decision-making processes. So drawing from our comprehensive experience, including our 2019 study that we conducted in collaboration with the Edmonton Social Planning Council, we understand the crucial needs of communities to support such initiatives. Participants want to feel heard from early project formation. They want to see tangible examples of how their feedback is utilized. And this demands that early engagement be structured as iterative, transparent, and relationship-based. Early communication and consultation are paramount, fostering an understanding and appreciation for the benefits that affordable housing brings to the entirety of the city's residents. Further, the earliest opportunities for engaging a community on the eventual transformation of the area aids in alleviating the potential for opposition to proposed changes. So recognizing the importance of clear intentions during consultations, we emphasize that providing communities with a level of clarity and predictability that other stakeholders have is essential. Considering the 17 surplus school sites that have been identified as locations of opportunity for affordable housing development, the expectation is that the communities where these sites are located should be engaged meaningfully with the same urgency undertaken in approving this updated affordable housing strategy. We noted that in this strategy, there isn't a mention of 16% affordable housing targets for all communities across the city. We would ask administration to continue to strive towards this target in order to bring options for people needing affordable housing, as well as supporting communities with existing high levels of affordable housing to see new diverse housing options. So we acknowledge that resolving these substantial issues demands concerted efforts from various stakeholders, including prospective neighbours, diligent city officials and sustained commitments from all government levels. So we are eager to continue our role as partners in this collective endeavour. We would ask to be included in the discussions around affordable housing going forward, as we understand the potential and strength that emerges when we unite to construct a thriving community. Thank you. And thank you. Next, we'll go to Chris Beasley. Please go ahead, you have five minutes. 
Thank you so much, Council. I really enjoy the opportunity to just be able to speak in support of this motion on behalf of the University of Alberta Students Union. Um, I, I would urge Council to support this. Um, things that I've mentioned in the past over the course of this year are that many students at any point in time are houseless. There are students who live in their cars or who are couch surfing or are who are just trying to get by. And that oftentimes many of the key demographics that have been identified in the affordable housing strategy put before council today overlap with the student experience. The students that I know are also dealing with disabilities. The students that I know also have dependents. The students that I know also struggle with finding places that they can rent without spending upwards of 30, 40, 50% of their income on housing at any point in time. I was particularly struck going through the affordable housing plan of the case study of charity um, within the affordable housing um, strategy. Charity, um, the case study, um, uh, so like their income predominantly came from H. And when I look around my community and especially the student leaders that I serve with, that's not unrepresentative of the people that I work with and the people that I go to school with. Um, oftentimes we don't recognize the overlap of our student populations with Edmonton's greater community and that students are susceptible to all the same pressures um, that reduce your income, that make it difficult to afford housing, especially housing at market rates. And so university students are oftentimes turned to the university proper, in my case, the University of Alberta, to access some of their needs. There's this idea that they can access housing at university, that they can go to residence, but residences for universities across the city, especially at the University of Alberta, are above market rates. And there are reasons for that. We can talk about, you know, long-term underfunding of post-secondary that caused them to need to keep their rental prices above market rates. We can talk about the extra programming that's offered um, in university residences and how that contributes to that. But broadly, there is no functional affordable option for students that need long-term affordable housing offered through the university. Even the universities, when it comes to short-term struggles, will offer emergency loans to students, but those emergency loans can't be used to pay off university costs including but not limited to the rent you might owe the university if you're renting, say, Lister Hall with the University of Alberta. Um, as well, the university does offer a wonderful short-term housing program where you can stay in Lister in a hotel for a number of weeks, um, but that ends at a certain point. That ends three, four weeks into accessing that short-term housing program. And so knowing that so many students are operating under agreement-based housing, where they might be in agreement with um, someone who lets them stay as long as they're not gay or not trans, as long as they're willing to stay as your partner, as long as they're willing to whatever it might be, students are forced out of their homes, forced into short-term um, accommodations that the university wonderfully provides, and then at the end of three, four weeks are faced with the market. Where do you go next after you've stayed those four weeks at the university? Um, if you didn't take out student loans at the beginning of the year, um, if you haven't been working this whole time, especially if you have disability or dependents, how do you afford a market rate? Ultimately, a lot of these solutions come in the form of just growing our affordable housing supply, and that's really why I want to affirm the direction that Council is looking at right now and what a lot of the other folks have spoken about already. I also want to wrap up just by noting that students have a stake in the city overall. Students know that right now the university is oftentimes the safest and warmest place for people to sleep. Um, people that would love to stay in better affordable housing situations and students see that and they know that affordable housing solutions need to be long term and come driven by council and so thank you folks. And thank you. Next we'll go to Quinn Wade. Please go ahead, you have five minutes. Um, Good morning, uh, I'm Quinn Wade. I'm uh, Lakota and Blackfoot from Treaty 7 territory, actually, originally. Um, I am the housing manager for Edmonton Two-Spirit uh, <coughs> um, Society. Um, <coughs> we can conditionally support the affordable housing strategy. Um, there's ample research data to support uh, the inclusion of LGBTQ plus plus people as a priority group, um, equal to the other groups in the strategy. However, on page 17, it's only mentioned once in the whole strategy, which we found a little bit concerning for us. Um, because our, the intersectional barriers that two-spirit people face uh, with regards to housing are very, very complex and diverse. Um, and it creates 
kind of a double whammy when you're looking at somebody who needs housing who is, is both indigenous and trans. That's, that's a double whammy of, of issues. And, and because of that, we have, are very overrepresented in the homeless populations, um, especially within Edmonton. Um, E2S would be more than willing to assist the city in understanding the housing needs of this demographic. Um, we have actually are doing an ongoing housing needs assessment for two-spirit people and with two-spirit people right on the land. We've, we've been in the camps, we've been in the organizations, um, we've been pretty much all over the, for the last few months doing it. Um, and what's come out of it is that 97.6% of 25, of, of two-spirit, sorry, two-spirit individuals reported safety as their biggest concern with regards to the housing. Um, many people who are in affordable housing or have, it, who are two-spirit have issues being in with places where they're not safe, where maybe their neighbors are homophobic or their neighbors are racist or their neighbors are both. I know that I've experienced it myself. Um, I've, I've been called various expletives living in my own building at times, and that's not safe for us. We need that, that housing that is safe for us to be in uh, with other two-spirit people and two-spirit elders who understand and, and knowledge keepers who understand and staff who understands and who can help keep us safe. 95.2% we're spending more than 30% of their monthly, monthly rental income on housing. 97.6% of two-spirit individuals live either in unstable housing conditions due to financial inaffordability of rent or flat out abusive situations where maybe they were staying with family members who are abusive to them, who do not accept their sexuality or who do not accept that they are even two-spirit if they are, you know, 60 scoop or intergenerational uh, adoptees. That is a huge problem. So they stay there because they can't afford to go anywhere else. And because they can't afford to go anywhere else, guess what? They're in an abusive situation. Sooner or later, they're going to be on the streets. And if they have kids, their kids are going to be on the streets. It, it just continues that intergenerational trauma. Um, uh, Edmonton LGBTQ seniors advocates groups have expressed the need for safe, affordable housing for seniors who are LGBTQ in Edmonton, yet this still hasn't become a reality. And I think that also needs to be addressed. Um, CMHC statistics tell us transgender and trans and gender nonconforming people in Canada are twice as likely to experience poverty and homelessness. So we don't see a whole lot of that in here, you know. Um, despite there's a there's a daybreak nonprofit housing in Ottawa study carried out right in the, the CMHC um, stuff. Um, and in my last minute, the concept of an indigenous housing liaison as a middleman, however well intentioned, prevents indigenous people from taking our place at the table. It's our voices that need to be heard directly. Well, support is always welcome. Indigenous people must always have a voice and a place at the table as decision makers in our own right for our own people. And this includes community-based research concepts in all things of ownership, control, access, and possession of our own applications and our own housing and our own experiences. And it's imperative that this liaison and any partners involved with the strategy understand that. There's a reason Indigenous people are disproportionately represented in demographics of homelessness. And that reason has been a long history of Indigenous people having been managed by governments, liaisons, and others without full inclusion. Building trust will necessarily and rightly uh, be an issue. And it may be difficult. And any position created must be understand Indigenous voices particularly two sport voices, must take precedence in decision making. Thank you. And thank you. And next we'll go to Ravesh Aprade. Yes, yeah. Hi there, please go ahead, you have five minutes. Yeah. Good morning everyone, my name is Bhavesh Upadhyay. I have been working with Tribal Chief Ventures in Edmonton as an engineer for the last six years. I have been granted the authority by our CEO, Cameron Alexis, to represent ECVI and its member First Nations. ECVI's overall goal is to improve the quality of life for its six member First Nations community members. 
PCVI is a not-for-profit corporation. PCVI is governed by the chiefs of the six member First Nations. Those are Ewan Lake Three Nations, Heart Lake First Nations, Whitefish Lake First Nations, Kihivin Three Nations, Hot Frog Lake First Nations, and Cold Lake First Nations. First, we are grateful to the city of Edmonton for awarding us the funding for a housing project that includes the construction of 64 affordable homes in Edmonton. PCVI owns and operates 28 affordable homes in the city of Edmonton. All units are currently occupied and 212 people from various first nations in the Alberta are on the waiting list, meaning the need for additional homes is evident. Moreover, at least 2,500 members of the six First Nations reside in Edmonton to attend school for medical reasons or to work. We are pleased to hear that the updated strategy supports increasing the diversity and affordability of the city of Edmonton's affordable housing supply to lift families and individuals out of homelessness and core housing needs. We take goal to build 2,700 affordable housing units by 2026. I am deeply grateful for the opportunity to lie and work on 36 land. I, I acknowledge and appreciate the rich history and cultural heritage of the indigenous people who have called this land home for generations. We look forward to further partnership with the city of Edmonton for a three cold eight amidst which is Vastaikan, meaning the big beaver hill house to be part of the joint solution to achieve our common goal. Thank you for your attention and we look forward to making a meaningful impact together. Thanks for the And thank you. Next we'll, Next. Go. Next we'll Next. go, uh, Bavesh, can you mute yourself now, please? Thank you. Next we'll go to Bree Cloud. Are you online? Madam Chair, it's yeah. Court Dawson and Bree Cloud here from Savita. If uh, uh, we're, our, we're actually scheduled to actually just answer any questions, but if, if you, you don't mind, I'll, I'll just make a couple of quick remarks on behalf of, of both of us sure. on behalf of Sita. And then if there's any questions at that end, we can proceed. That sounds there. great. Okay, please go ahead, Gord. Thank you. So thank you to council and administration for all of the work so far in the creation and now renewal of the affordable housing plan. Sabita is very much in support of this renewed plan. We are proud of the amazing partnerships Sabita has developed with the city, community not-for-profit partners, and other levels of government as we continue to provide affordable housing for those in need in our city. Through continued investments from the city of Edmonton, government of Alberta, and the federal government, Sabita has expanded our affordable housing by approximately 500 new homes over the course of the last 18 months to bring the total number of affordable units we managed to just over 5,300. Since this time last year, Savita has housed approximately 2,500 more Edmontonians in need of affordable housing in our city. The investments made by the city, the government of Alberta, and the federal government have enabled that success. Savita now houses approximately 15,000 people in need of affordable housing in our community. We have three new capital projects in our development pipeline that we are very excited about. Upon completion, these developments would house approximately 1,000 more people in our city in need of affordable housing. Of note, the large majority of these new planned units are units with larger numbers of bedrooms to serve larger families. We are particularly excited about uh, potential investment in rear rent geared to income housing going going forward in this plan. Savita has just over 3,900 individual families on our priority list. Most of, of these families are those in need of rent geared to income housing. We very much look forward to our continued partnerships with the 
city and other levels of government under this, this plan to continue to maintain and build new homes for those in need. So uh, that's it and we are available to answer any questions at the end here. Thank you. Wonderful, and thank you, Gord. Next, uh, I'll see if Hannah Bain is online. Hannah, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi there. Please go ahead, you have five minutes. Awesome, hello everyone. My name is Hannah Bain, and I am here today on behalf of Climate Justice Edmonton. As you look to updating the affordable housing strategy today and addressing agenda item 7.1, we think it's important to take a look at some of the actions the city and EPS are currently taking. EPS has used safety and gang activity as their reason for sweeping encampments in the cold in the past weeks. Edmontonians should not be expected to take this claim without evidence. Did kneeling on the neck of an Indigenous drummer make Edmontonians safer? Did making national headlines by arresting a journalist make Edmontonians safer? Did piling onto an Indigenous elder, bloodying him up, and taking him away in handcuffs make Edmontonians safer? Council, you need to ask. Did EPS and the city just displace hundreds of people, some of whom cannot access shelter spaces, in order to seize one person's novelty sword collection? In fact, is there any evidence that anyone was made any safer by all, at all through these actions, or did they just make life a lot more difficult for the people already struggling the most? Imagine if the city's contact with people in an encampment was about offering support, if city teams were collaboratively with people living outside to make living outside safer. If instead of pushing people from place to place, the city became a resource trusted by campers to get the safety, fire safety training and a way to access insulated shelters and safe warming equipment. The city could provide the same amenities housed people take for granted, like running water and recycling pickup and ensuring 24 seven at washroom access. The city could help arrange safe storage instead of tossing people's belongings in the garbage. And most importantly, instead of finding the most extreme thing they're allowed to do within the council approved framework, your deputy city managers could work with people living outside as valued members of our communities, instead of treating unhoused people like nuisance or garbage. These actions don't need the cooperation of other levels of government or the police, so there's no excuse. We demand that you implement the principles for municipalities set out in the National Protocol for Homeless Encampments in Canada, recognizing that unhoused people are people who have the rights as same as housed people and that municipal governments have the power to make their lives much better or much worse. We demand that you fire Dale McPhee and re-exert oversight and accountability for EPS. While you do not direct the police, you are responsible for the police mission. You lack any hint of movement on police accountability and your ongoing ever expanding funding of the police has encouraged them to act with impunity. Affordable and adequate housing that meets people's diverse needs is the solution to helplessness. You need to do more to create enough safe and adequate housing because we know the UCP isn't going to, and we've been waiting for the federal government for too long. Also, councillors who voted for police funding formula, you assured us that you would not let this come at the expense of other services. So don't tell us you don't have the money when you find the money for police every time. As you know, the need for more affordable housing is one of the most universally agreed upon issues in our city. The UCB government is unaccountable to Edmontonians and we cannot rely on them to do a job they don't believe in. We know that providing housing is supposed to be done by other levels of government and we know that your tools as a municipality are limited. We support your decision to recognize this as what it is, an emergency. But this will be a publicity stunt if you don't take meaningful action to end homelessness. As Edmontonians, we have been and will be behind you if you make any steps on solving this crisis. Thank you. Okay, next I'm just going to check if Robert Tate has made it. Oh, great, okay, Robert, uh, the clerk will guide you to your seat. What we'll do is we'll just go, Jeannie, did you want to go ahead first while he's making his way to the seat? Go ahead. My name is Jeannie and I'm a renter, someone who's been a part of the core housing need myself. Um, I have an expected eviction sometime this spring for owners to develop a new property. I also live in poverty, but uh, I have- Sorry, Jeannie, can you move a little bit closer to the microphone? I also Thank live you. in poverty, but have a beautiful support uh, network in my community. The color of my skin is white and I have access to many resources. I am currently living in Riverdale where I have witnessed people in the core housing need 
And as a neighbor, I have felt unsure how to engage or what to do, and I didn't want to call 311. That led me to apply to be a loss tender and be a part of SOLOS, which is a prototype for offering community care to folks living in encampments, part of the 3,000 people without a permanent home. As a loss tender, I have shared co-creating art with people in encampments, and through this time, I have, since last summer, um, created relationships at the Roland Road Camp. These are my friends. I have built art. I have taught them ballet. I have drawn, we have sing, we've done ceremony, we have danced, we have, um, I learned guitar, I, we sing, we do therapy. And big man, Roy Car Cardinal, is my friend whom I love. He is a leader of the community and I have a lot of respect for him. And I've witnessed his regard for the land and the people on it. That has led me to, oh sorry, um, the housing affordability talk about investing in houselessness prevention and delivering comprehensive supports service. And what I have learned is core to both is building strong, meaningful relationships and investing in community. I have also watched these relationships be ignored and disrespected, such as what happened last Tuesday and Wednesday when the cops came in heavy handed after making an agreement, which was a lie. I put down my regard, and the people I love were hurt and re-traumatized and displaced in one of the coldest times on record in the city. Um, these approaches don't work. They're not collaborative relationships, and they're setbacks. Mistrust is impended. Um, it impends what, impedes, sorry, what happens. Um, where they could have met, they had a chance to meet with the elders and to change the narrative, and give, but they gave that false hope, and um, it's only caused more problems. In this strategy, the city describes its role in housing affordability and houselessness, prevent, houselessness prevention in terms of 10 activities. What is absent from this list is listening and learning from people and enabling versus standing in the way of community members like me, to be a part of the solution. There's a ripple effect from all of this. Um, yeah, I believe there's stewards of this land and it requires us to really take some time. What real reciprocity means is taking the time and investing in relationships to understand there's a deep, deeper meaning here. There's things we need to learn. We can't do this again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Robert Tate. Please, Robert, go ahead. You have five minutes. Thank you. My name is uh, Robert Tate. My other name is Makane Makwa. I'm an Anishinaabe and Nini. Um, I want to uh, start by acknowledging uh, the, the Treaty uh, 6 that we're, the land that we're on here. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that that, that that treaty was broken within months of it being signed. Um, I know that, that, that treaty acknowledgements are often um, just a formality before you guys get to the real business, but, uh, but the land is the real business and the land, the land ownership is, uh, is um, I, I, I don't believe that it's, it's, it's uh, since those treaties were broken, the, the, this, this government here is de facto and, and uh, and the land should be go back. Um, reconciliation is is, uh, is a big word these days, but but it, it just seems to be words with no action behind it. We talk about reconciliation, but we, but we uh, but we just continue to to uh, impose poverty upon upon the First Nations people of this land. We marginalize them out out to the edges of society. And, and then when they're when they're camped out on the on the on the absolute edges of society where where they're then we come and tell them you can't be here either you must you get, you got to get out of here too so it's uh it's it's a, it's a tragedy I have personal experience with homelessness I've been homeless twice twice in my life I'm now I'm now uh, pursuing a doctorate in clinical psychology 
and I've been uh, I've been a home renter for for many years now. I, I contribute to the society, so, so these are not throwaway people. These are these are not people who who don't contribute to society. These are not people who don't don't have a chance to to do something with their lives. I, I am proof to this. I worked for five years on the street outreach program with, with Boyle Street. So, so I've worked with, with, the, with the people in the camps in the, in the river valleys for, for many years. I also worked on the crisis diversion team. And I worked with soul loss. So, so I have much experience around the homelessness. And I think that people need to, to know that, 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 we, that we need to listen, like Jeannie said, listening and learning and moving forward in a good way um, to, to impose poverty upon people and, and, make, and then make homelessness a crime is, is not the, the way forward. I want, to, I want solutions um, to, to tear down camps with, without, when people don't have places to go is, is not right. Um, indigenous people have been camped in this river valley for up to 30,000 years. And now in the past 30 years, we've made it illegal. So, um, so, that's, so that's all but all I have to say. I wanted you guys to think about that. Shima Gwich. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Cheyenne. Hi, you have five minutes. Please go ahead. Tense kakyan weg maganak. Hello, my relatives. Shan mingo keheo ni sigatson. My name is Shan mingo keheo. I'm Eskwichua Skaiken Otsinia. I am from Edmonton uh, here in Treaty 6 territory, but I too consider myself a guest on this land. My maternal roots are in Driftpal Cree Nation in northern Alberta in Treaty 8 territory. So even though I was born and raised here, I am a guest on this land. Uh, I come to you today as the Executive Director of the Edmonton Two Spirit Society. It is my honor to be here to um, speak to this strategy. Uh, I know that our organization has had much transition over the last couple of years and that those who were involved in the um, uh, focus groups and the participation of uh, developing of this strategy was not myself and I want to acknowledge that I was not involved in this process but that our organization was. And while E2S sees the need for affordable housing as a crucial step to housing Indigenous people in Edmonton, it must be noted that an important demographic has been virtually left out of the 12 priority groups in this strategy, that of LGBTQIA plus individuals, particularly two-spirit people. Although we were included in the focus group, we do not see our voice in this strategy, and I think that that is something that needs to be brought to the table. 25% of women-led households, 25% target women-led households, yet there are no targets for affordable housing for our queer and trans relatives, particularly those who are in the intersection of being Indigenous. GBV, or gender-based violence, impacts the 2SLGBTQIA plus community at disproportionate rates. And strategies need to intentionally support this community that is hardest hit by colonial impacts and by violence relating to colonization. If we are talking human rights, then we need to ensure that our human rights meaningfully include all humans. We would like to see more inclusion of two-spirit folks into this strategy. And um, E2S is working towards positively contributing to the housing crisis in Edmonton by developing our own housing project. And I won't get into the details of that project now, but um, we know that our project is limited. We uh, can't solve the housing crisis, um, but we are doing our best to ensure that two-spirit people have a voice and that they will have a home or have people behind them rallying to get them a home. <clears throat> There is much work to be done to ensure housing stability for all Edmontonians. Um, and while this strategy is on the right path, we see that there can be room for improvements. E2S is committed to supporting this strategy to ensure that two-spirit, queer, and trans, indigenous inclusion is brought in moving forward. So um, I don't have much more to say. Um, I, I believe my colleague Quinn um, did say quite a bit, uh, and we are very excited about the process of, of our own housing project, but. Um, that's not going to meet the needs of all of our two-spirit kin. So we encourage uh, further dialogue, further inclusion, and further you know, equitable, meaningful support of our community. Hi, hi, Kina Nashkomitenawao. Thank you for listening. And thank you. Next, I will call again for Louis Francesco Francescuti. Are you there? 
No. So I think, I believe there are no other registered speakers. All right, so we'll go next to questions of the speakers. I'll ask my colleagues to sign up, please. Mr. Mayor, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for, uh, for, for joining us and the, and the advocacy work and the real uh, on-the-grounds work that you do in the community to uh, help uh, 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 the most vulnerable Edmontonians. I want to start with either maybe Jean or, or Quinn. Uh, uh, the, so either to Jean or Quinn, whoever wants to answer this. Uh, I hear your concerns, so just want to know what what needs to change. What do you what do you would what do you you would like to see included that that approach becomes as inclusive as possible? Hello. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> um, I I think a lot of it comes right down to us being at the table when I, when we're looking at a strategy like this. Our voice, even though we were consulted, our voice took less precedence. It was almost as an afterthought in the paragraph on page 17, if you actually look. And it, that, I think that's where the issue is. We need to be fully included as equal, as equal collaborators in this. And, and it, in our indigenous ways, we actually don't have partnerships. We have collaborations okay. because of that reconciliation process. Um, we have partnerships with other Indigenous organizations. We have collaborations with non-Indigenous organizations. We'd be happy to collaborate with you. However, not at, we need to be on equal footing, okay. right? And I think when we're looking at a situation where uh, we are disproportionately represented uh, within the houseless population, we need to therefore be included in that equal partnership because of that, simply because of that, okay. if for no other reason. So that's what we're looking at kind of as a solution that we would, we, we need to be at the table. We need to be included okay. much more than right now, Indigenous and Two-Spirit and LGBTQ people are. Okay. Thanks. You wanna add, Gia? Sure, yeah. Um, I would also just say like the fact that there are no targets that like actually name us and, and bring visibility to us is, is a really big issue. Um, it's more than just bringing us to the table because that almost could be bordering onto organization, which is I think where Quinn was headed with his comment. We don't want to be brought to the table just to check a checkbox. Oh we want to actually be brought to the table and we want to see that there are strat like, elements of this strategy that are specific to our community. Um, and, I, and I just wanted to be known that there is a lot of lateral violence within the Indigenous community towards Two-Spirit people, and that really is the mission of E2S, is to reintegrate our Two-Spirit people back into the circle. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that like Indigenous doesn't fully include us, right? Um, the TRC calls to action meaningfully erase us, actually. Yeah. We are not included in those. So no, no, yeah, that would be my answer. No, thank you for that, because our administration and this council has been on uh, this journey of actually better understanding the needs of the, the community. So, you know, obviously there's most to be done to understand and, uh, and improve that, right? So no, appreciate those, that feedback. Uh, on, uh, for, for Candace, Candace Noble, uh, the solutions are there. You highlighted some of the work that you're doing to actually housing people, right? The issue is is just scaling those solutions and the uh, and the not having enough resources to scale those solutions. Be careful, Mr. Mayor. If you keep asking me questions, I'll keep coming back. Yes, uh, please, please, it's important. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the challenge is scale and diversity of, of options. Okay. So if we're looking at the uh, Housing First uh, program, that's the, the housing work that we primarily do at Business Centre. So um, we have to access market housing right now in order to provide housing to those folks. And given the basic income, um, it's just market housing is in completely inaccessible. And so the, we need to create different types of housing, um, not just a one bedroom apartment or a studio apartment. They're mm. not, that doesn't fit for everyone. Um, and then we need more affordable options and rental supplements that are tied to an individual or an increase in basic income, yeah. of course. So you said the market housing is not accessible. That's because of the income is not enough to pay for the rents that are 
required. That's correct. Okay, and the diversity of housing is diverse needs out there for more than one or two bedrooms. That's correct. Yes, okay. yeah. and I, I think Mark, it's also important to highlight the fact that market housing doesn't provide, often doesn't provide the community element that oh, so many I people see. lack. Um, okay. So congregate in different types of settings where whether it's co-op housing mm -hmm. or group living situations in, in homes, um, there's there's a need. We really focus, uh, given our colonial approach to things, we really focus on on that one bedroom apartment that mm -hmm. we really be, seem to be uh, going after that, but it's expensive. Um, and the reality of, of it is, is that we can create op options for people that cr not just create affordable options, but create a meaning, improve their quality of life. Good. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm out of time. Thank you. Councillor Paquette? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I think I'll just uh, start out with Robert. I just want to say thank you for coming to speak. And I know that that wasn't easy and uh, for speaking your truth. And I really appreciate that. Um, I, uh, this is very difficult stuff to talk about. And my question for you is, um, and I'm gonna preface it. Right now on social media and in the world, we're seeing a lot of very open racism and hate. And people saying that even if we talk about it, that it's some kind of, that that's racism in itself, just talking about it. And it was a reverse racism in some way, which I don't understand but I think it's probably just made up so that people can feel better about it. Um, so, and a lot of people are shocked. They're like, wow, look at all this open racism. But you know, and I know, that this has always existed. In fact, it's embedded in our institutions. And that's why we are here today uh, with all of this uh, um, consternation and the challenges around indigenous housing and poverty. So my question for you is, um, we've heard the things that you're concerned about. Um, I want to hear what you feel the path is to success here. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think there, there needs to be a lot of collaboration. I think that, the, that we need to go to the Indigenous community, to the Indigenous leaders, including the two-spirited community. It's a, it's a shame that, that, that they're, they're, they're experiencing exclusion and uh, marginalization. Um, I, feel, I feel that, uh, yeah, Housing First is, is, is a option, but it seems that it's, it's the only option or, or one of the only options that it's always, we always go to Housing First. I also worked uh, for Housing First as well. I, I didn't mention that earlier, but, 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 uh, but I, it's, it's a model that um, has some flaws, we'll say. And um, I think that housing doesn't necessarily mean a building. It, 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 it's housing is, or a home, it's more home. A home is not, it is, people can make a home we don't need to have a Western idea of, of, of housing. A hundred years ago, we had, you know, um, teepees down in Riverdale. That 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 was their home. That was that, that was considered a home. Now, now that's not no longer considered a home. But but that was a home for 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 time immemorial for our people. We were we were in in those teepees in the, in those wigwams. We had those we had those encampments. So, so we need to expand our idea of, of, of housing. We need to expand our idea of, of what is what is a home, and and uh, and maybe um, allow more um, broader ideas to come to the table. Okay. So I just want to clarify that what I'm hearing is that the institutions that we have that have led us to this situation are trying to find the solutions in the exact same institutional thinking and that maybe there is a way to open that up to invite in different perspectives and creative ways of thinking and approaching this stuff is that am i hearing you correctly? yeah yeah that's that's right i, I th like one of the problems that that happens with, with the homeward or the housing first model <coughs> is that it separates people from their communities so people have a community when they when they're camped together you know Jeannie talked about Roland Road, you know, there was, there was, that is a community. 
that is that and and once they start put, put, putting one person in a one bedroom suite here one person in a one bedroom suite there you know then they experience other things like loneliness and, 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 and depression because because they're they've lost that community right okay so that's interesting because what we've heard from elders is that this is the biggest problem we have that the problem isn't drugs drugs are a reaction to a loss of community and belonging a loss of that feeling of communal purpose and individual purpose in that in that system is that yeah certainly it's a it's a mask it's a it's a i mean it's like taking an aspirin you feel bad you want to feel better right i mean nobody wants to feel bad nobody wants to be in pain Okay, perfect. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Rice? Uh, first of all, thank you, every, every speaker, and uh, take time to uh, speak on this very important topic. Um, my first question is going to uh, Professor uh, Dr. Evans. Um, so I strongly agree with you about uh, the three strengths uh, you mentioned in the updated strategy and for the data-driven and the equity center and proactively address this issue. Um, so from this updated strategy, because our city strategy started 2016, that is the first, and then right now we presented the updated one. So what specific change um, or outcomes and based on this updated strategy, you would like to see. So the question is, which outcomes I would like to see based on the strategy? Yes, this strategy is updated. Well, what would be different, and from the old one developed back to 2016? Well, I think this strategy um, is different in that it's uh, used a, a different approach for calculating need. It's identified who needs housing and what kind of housing might be needed. So it's more offers more detail in that regard. Um, and so that speaks to the, the methodology underlying this strategy um, and the way that's been used to calculate the projected need going forward through time. Well, there's always limitations with data, and as been pointed out here, there's been, you know, there's some some um, equity seeking priority populations that have been overlooked. Um, I think this is what sets this strategy apart from from the previous strategy. Uh, as well, I, I think the targets are more ambitious, uh, and that's likely given the fact that there's a better understanding of of the need here in the community. Uh, because you mentioned, I agree with you, you mentioned about the limitation of the data and how that limitation will impact uh, city to identify the needs for the certain group because we already heard concern and from other speakers. And is there any way you can say and we can improve that to identify the needs and what we heard from other speakers and it is missing in this strategy? Yeah, I think the other speakers have provided some really great insight into how to address some of the data limitations and, and certainly involving um, folks, putting them at the center of decision-making processes is, is one positive step forward. There's always going to be limitations to data, and, and so for, with the example of census data, um, you know, with different measures, uh, uh, there's always limitations and uncertainties. Uh, and, to a certain degree, we can work at the local level to try and supplement that data through our own data gathering activities. And so that's one, um, one thing we can do as a local community, community here. Um, but again, I'd also emphasize just centering lived experience uh, in an ongoing way uh, as this strategy is uh, implemented. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, my next question is going to Chris. Grace, University of Alberta Student Union. Um, I think the students' needs and for the affordable housing and the ESC is obvious there. Um, I really uh, strongly support and we do need some like more housing uh, supports for the students. 
um, from this updated strategy and uh, from students' perspective, what would you like to see the key difference could bring to the community? Thank you so much for the question, um, Councillor Rice. I really, I'm, I'm, I'm here speaking in support because students need a diversity of options, and I know that doesn't directly answer your question, um, but different students will need different things. Many of them will be coming with dependents. Many of them will need housing that is supportive to their identities as trans or two-spirit students as well, and they need safe, um, supportive communities that will allow them to thrive. Um, Really, though, the, the, the two big things that I'd encourage council to look at are that every student, regardless of whether or not they're in core housing need, um, need a reduction of the market rates that they're paying right now. The other piece is that every student, regardless of which communities they belong to and what housing they're going to be looking for out of this, um, just need more affordable housing supply because their housing can go in an instant. They can come out as trans and be kicked out of their house. Um, and so reducing some of the wait times um, that are experienced right now before you get into those affordable housing programs can really transform the experience for students. I hope that okay. answers your question, Councillor Rice. Yeah, yes, that's a very good answer. Thank you so much. My time is out. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Tang? Uh, great. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, just want to thank everybody uh, for coming out online in person for your very, very excellent presentations. Uh, you know, poignant, uh, you know, on point and I, I've learned a lot. I have so many questions for actually for all of you, but I'm very conscious of our agenda today. So um, I'm gonna limit it to Jeannie and Robert. Um, and I really appreciate you sharing a little bit, a glimpse of the SOLAS initiative that you're, you're a part of. And may, maybe to start, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about this initiative because not everyone's aware of it. It's not very, it's not brought up very often. It is um, a city-funded initiative, um, and it sounds like, from Jeannie, you went from seeing people who live next to you as strangers to forming friendships. Uh, and I see huge potential in that for some of the goals directly mentioned in this strategy. And I just want you to hear a little bit more from you about um, why did you get involved? What is it? What is the, what, what is the impact you've seen for both yourself and, um, well, I'll let you speak for, for, uh, you know, for, for your own, own experience, and what do you see as the potential in informing the actions in this strategy? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, well, so loss uh, for me was a opportunity to um, go back to the community that I, I have a lot of, um, um, my heart is with, with the homeless community and part of that is, is because of my, my own personal experience with homelessness and, and, uh, and so for me to have an opportunity to, to, uh, to access, see a lot of the, like the, you know, you know street outreach, um, crisis diversion, these teams are out there, but, but they're, they're only, um, they're, they're focused on primary needs, lower levels of the Maslow's um, hierarchy. So we, we wanted to get it to, we feel that the people who are experiencing houselessness often um, don't get the best. They get just the leftovers or, or just, just the, the crumbs of society basically. And we wanted to offer them higher level um, options to, to, to deal with um, things that, that are, we, that were found to be important to them when, when the, we went out and talked to them, and that was grief and loss. So that was prim the primary um, focus of, of SOLAS was to deal with, with grief and loss. And, and everybody, that's something that everybody in this room and everybody in this world has in common. We've all, uh, we've all experienced those, that grief and that loss. Mm -hmm. And we know that, that how devastating that can be. And then the people who are living on the streets have even more of that loss. And, and then when, when they lose their encampments, that's more loss. And then they lose their tents, and that's more loss. And it's loss piled upon loss. So we wanted to go and alleviate some of that loss and allow them to have a place to, to take that, just to come and talk to us. Lost tenders, we were just like, like people that you could just talk to. We didn't come with an agenda. We didn't come with a, with a, with a plan, with a solution, with, with a, hey, we can get you this, we can get you that. No, we just want to talk to you as people. Yeah. We just introduced ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Please. Yeah, it's taking the time, breaking bread, what I've learned, I was a neighbor. 
I coming here, my neighbors are gone. People I check on regularly, mm -hmm. people who have a ripple effect on my life and I've had a ripple effect on their life. It's a deep connection. Most people they say are scared of them. We come, we share, we take time, we listen to understand. It's a real alignment to um, being an ally, understanding the culture, the way of living, the, as Robert said, as we need like to understand the indigenous landscape is different. There's a, a disproportion here. And I feel like we were just honestly, like a lot of emotional support, bringing light, inspiration, holding space for people who feel like they don't have a voice, they're not being heard, like they fall. Mm -hmm. You know, big man is helping people get off drugs. People go to him as a mentor. People come, they gather all the time. I've met over 50, 60 people, I can't even count. The amount of people, friends, I've met to help recover from the darkness and the, the issues that are systemic. Yeah, Jeannie, um, I, I am running out of time, but I just wanna highlight kind of what you said that this is a way for everyday Edmontonians to find a way to support each other wherever they are in the journey. And I saw that reflected and happy to follow up you know, offline, but really appreciate both of you for being here and sharing that window. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Uh, any other colleagues with any other questions for our speakers? I don't see anyone signed up, so I'd like to thank all, all of our speakers for being here today and sharing your personal experiences and everything, we, we really do appreciate it. So I'll ask you to please, if you don't mind sitting back there, and we're gonna invite our administration forward to ask questions of them now, please. Questions to administration, right? Uh, and Chair, do you do you want me to move the recommendation at this time, or should we wait till we go through the? No, you're, it's fine to move the recommendation now if you like. Yes. Okay. Okay, I will move that the Community and Public Services Committee recommend to Council that the City of Edmonton updated affordable housing strategy 2023-2026 as outlined in attachment one of the January 15, 2024 Community Services Report CS016373 be approved. Okay. And uh, you want me to start with questions? I'll start with that. So, Crystal, I asked this question to some of the folks who felt, uh, particularly from the LGBTQ and uh, to spirit community that the level of engagement that they would prefer uh, wasn't there, which I appreciate because uh, you know we are on this journey and we're learning new things and learning new way of engagement. So this is not a, in any way criticism or anything. Just wanna know how, how will we continue to engage and learn from that and, uh, and, and uh, engage more deeply? Sure, thanks for the question, uh, Mayor Sohi. So, uh, I, you know, I think it's fair to say that uh, there, certainly there could have been more references in the, in the strategy and um, part of that just reflects participation at the time. It sounds like the Two-Spirit Society is doing their own needs assessment and we'd be grateful to include that data in a future housing needs assessment and have more information around that. But I also wanted to say I think um, the references in the strategy doesn't fairly or doesn't necessarily translate into uh, our team's focus on that in terms of showing the debt level of dedication. We're actually engaged in three Pro projects right now to help meet the specific housing needs of the LGBTQ2S plus community in Edmonton. Um, there's a seniors housing project we're working on. We're working with the Two Spirit Society on a shelter project as well, um, and also with um, a group that focuses on serving the needs of LGBTQ2S plus newcomers from who speak French from Africa. And so uh, we are our team is heavily engaged in trying to fill those gaps. We hear it all the time that there's a gap, and going forward in the next update of the needs assessment, we'd love to include more data from the Two Spirit. Society and, and any other stakeholders who might have new data. That's part of why we recommend updating it every two years. Got it, got it. Thank you, thank you for, for that. Uh, we also heard that the, the 2026 targets for uh, 2,700 units of affordable housing and 14 to 1,700 units of 
supportive housing may not be ambitious. I just want to get your response to that. So the target um, reflects what was approved in the last budget cycle in terms of the uh, capital profile and the operating profile that was put forward. But one thing I will say is we are hoping to bring forward later this year an updated affordable housing investment plan that may adjust that target based on um, some potential new funding that we're looking at through the Housing Accelerator Fund and other, um, oh, I see. So other these, funding. So these targets don't factor into that future funding yet, right? Yeah, that's correct. So we are going to, and there's there was some other funding that we got post that target being created as well that wasn't expected at the time. And so we're going to take a look at all of that together and our new strategy and what it says in terms of priority and come back to council with an updated investment plan. Got, got it. And on the, on the diversity of housing and uh, meeting the needs of diverse population, we heard, you know, one bedroom, two bedrooms may not meet the needs of the communities. So the updated housing what are we discussing today? Uh, you think that is reflective of uh, some of those concerns and meeting the needs of the diverse populations in Edmonton? Yeah, I would say that um, along with that investment plan, we also have our city policy C601, which is our investment guidelines for affordable housing, and we'll be reviewing those this year as well to ensure alignment with the strategy. So the emphasis on priority populations in the strategy needs to be translated practically into our action, and so the policy review is also an, an opportunity to update that to ensure that we're um, focusing on those priority needs. Okay, and did the, did the strategy also factor in some of the changes, I would say transformative changes this council has made on the zoning, zoning review uh, stuff, right? So uh, is that factored into uh, increasing the diversity of housing and the uh, and make, uh, reducing some of the red tape related to zoning regulations and all that? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, I think part of the reason why you don't see as much in terms of market housing supply in this strategy sp specifically is because Edmonton has already removed a lot of the barriers to market housing supply. Um, obviously, there's still more that we can do, and in our Housing Accelerator Fund Action Plan, which will hopefully be approved soon, there's uh, some further ideas um, around that. But I think that uh, that's why we reference that as the strategy aligning with that. Um, they're very much being developed, co-developed, <laughs> um, but mm -hmm. fortunately, in Edmonton, this council has made a lot of decisions already to remove the barriers that might exist in other cities. Okay. And on the on the 16% target for for each neighborhood, uh, I, I support that target. I think it's very important that uh, the affordable housing is available in every community. Uh, but how do we achieve that? Like, what levers do we have to ensure that that it that is achieved? So that's a good question. Um, we, the main, I would say the primary lever that the city has is around land and making sure that we're acquiring land in areas that um, don't have high percentage of affordable housing already, uh, just because we know the reason often affordable housing is in some more in some parts of the city is because land, of the rent land cost, right? So if mm -hmm. land's more affordable in one part of the city, then housing providers will naturally go there to try and save on costs so they can keep rents lower. So I think if the main lever the city has to ensure housing in all parts of the city is to look at how we're making land available in all parts of the city, and sometimes that might require some acquisition, sometimes it just means making surplus land available. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Thank you, Councillor Prince Bay. Uh, maybe just to close the loop on that one. Uh, Sorry, Councillor Knack, we're, we're having a hard time hearing you. Hold on. Let's try this oh, other device. That's great. Yeah, great. Better? Thank you. We can hear you now. Yes. Yes, that's great. We can hear okay. you fine. Thank you. Uh, so just to close the loop on on that. Um, that last set of questions there. I appreciate that um, you know we we have this target and we've talked about acquisition, and we've been investing quite a bit of money into this over the last since 2019. Is there most of my feeling is most of the money has typically been um, put into um, developing projects versus um, further acquisition of lands. And so I guess I want to just double check with all the money that council has approved um, in the various budget cycles. Is there money available to acquire land in those communities where they might have no affordable housing at this point? So certainly there isn't enough to meet the 16% target um, yeah. in the short term. Uh, we do, you know, we primarily at this point are funded to acquire land um, around our supportive housing uh, projects. And so we use that budget primarily to optimize um, 
you know, to, to, to pursue that goal. Uh, I think we are always at, on the administration side, though, looking for you know opportunity purchases that might come up uh, that we can take advantage and trying to work with other parts of administration to align our resources to maximize um, you know acquisition opportunities. So, for example, you know if there's uh, sometimes closed school sites come up and the parks group is interested and we're interested, but in general, um, you know we have you know it's a delicate balance that we try to strike between meeting our unit targets and planning for the next set of unit targets, uh, which yeah. is coming down the pipe. Well, and, and so I guess that that just leaves me to sort of ask, you know, we've been using our surplus school sites, which is great. Um, uh, that often is being developed in room or in communities where maybe there already is more, at least that's what I've generally been seeing uh, affordable housing than not. So I I guess with with this, what what is the, how do we make sure that, you know, maybe a community that that might have higher land values than than many of the other communities where, where land has often been used for this is going to in fact be acquired you know what 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 sort of our our way forward to to provide that that distribution throughout the entire city well i think council neck there's a couple challenges so one is obviously the cost of land but the other challenge is just there's limited development opportunity in some neighborhoods um you know some neighborhoods are newer than others and they're not going to be going through a redevelopment cycle uh, in the near future because they're fully developed and uh, you know the, the size of the lots or whatever it is would make it cost prohibitive. Uh, so one of the things that our team's been looking at is actually looking at the 16% on a district basis and that would align more with where the city plan is going as well too. And then that can let us prioritize acquisitions um, on a district level as well, which I think can align better with some of our city planning pieces around transportation, um, you know, parks, all those other uh, services that we're trying to deliver on a district basis. We can find more opportunities, I think, that way to integrate housing near or around them and um, try to save, uh, you know, get more bang for our buck, if that makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I think, other than, but those, you know, ultimately, um, we work really closely with real estate constantly to identify, uh, you know, areas where there, we city has land that we can make available for housing. And I think we're, you know, we have an excellent relationship there. Anything that's surplus to city needs that is potentially useful for residential, pretty much our team claims. Uh, so I think we are sort of doing everything we can, you know, short of investing more resources, but we also know, you know, the budget cycles are different, uh, mm -hmm. difficult conversations and there's a lot of priorities that the city has to consider. So looking at maybe the, the, the last question on this, um, you know, I think about the sites that were developed by Jasper Place Wellness in Glenwood, you know, three individual lots uh, where they built 12 unit developments. Um, is that something we're thinking about? I, mean, I guess mm -hmm. my biggest worry is, if we're, if we're looking at this solely from through a district lens, I think about some of the communities that I represent, which do have very high land values. And and if we're, and so there's this balance between trying to get the best bang for your buck, but at the same time, um, making sure every community actually does have some um, some role to play and a recognition that it makes more complete communities when you have affordable housing, even in the most wealthy communities in the city. And so. You know, is there a way to take the Jasper Place model and saying, hey, we might not build a 45 unit build the development, multi story development, but we're going to buy one lot in this community, uh, you know, or three mm -hmm. individual lots scattered throughout to make sure that there's at least something that's that's going to be brought into every neighborhood. Yeah, absolutely, Council Nack. Um, we do, you know, we're in con we constantly are in conversation with the housing providers, and we're always open to looking at small infill models. Um, you know, in, in with the example of Jasper Place specifically, they are interested in doing that in many parts of the city, and that's something that we have supported uh, in Glenwood, but we'll also continue to support in different neighborhoods. So, uh, yeah, we look at all scale of housing development for the most part in terms of how the city can support it. Uh, I think we do require a minimum of five units for our investment program, um, but you know, typically with some of the you know zoning changes and whatnot, uh, it's that's something that can be achieved um, quite easily now in Edmonton. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much. I still have a few follow-up questions regarding the union targets, not overall targets. And so some some of my questions answers through uh, Mayor so his questions. So my first question uh, in terms of uh, affordable housing unions, the two 2,807 unions, um, 
is there any way and the city administration could be considered to enhance the focus on the concerns we heard from the public speakers, specifically including LGBTQ plus community and also the disability uh, community and also the students' needs. So I would like to learn more about the, uh, is there any plan already considered and in this updated strategy? Uh, thank you, Council Rice. That's a good question. Uh, so there's two ways that I think that we'll be looking at adjusting targets uh, going forward, and, and the strategy really is meant to be a living a living document that guides this. But the first is with that updated investment plan. Um, so on our side in Min, we work really hard to make sure we maximize every dollar that Council provides us through the budget process. And so what we'll be looking at with our investment plan is seeing if we can adjust that uh, overall target, up, um, you know, hopefully up if we can. Um, uh, while being mindful of the environment we're operating in, where obviously there's been a lot of cost escalations oh. and whatnot. But when it comes to the subunit targets, uh, I think we are definitely open to creating additional targets around specific priority populations. Uh, there's a number of tactics in the strategy that uh, single out particular ones like an accessible housing strategy, et cetera. But I think that's something that we can look at with more information um, around the need and with specific, specifically around LGBTQ2S+. It's it has been difficult to get information because it's not included in the census. But if we have groups uh, in the community that can help inform the calculations around the need, then that then absolutely looking at sub, sub targets around that is something we could do. Okay, wonderful, wonderful for that. And because this is living documents when we implemented and. I would like to see the more efforts and put this three category as just mentioned, and to see that emphasize and focus and how we uh, increase that support and for LGBTQ plus and some disabilities and also students communities. Uh, that's the first question. The second question is about about the support of the unions and because you know the target the union target is given to is only six. 144. How is that 644 supportive unions calculated? And is there any way and then um, these targets will be adjusted and to to meet the needs because the needs may may have like dynamic change. Another great question, Councilor Rice. So um, that number is targeted, is based on what resources the city has to, uh, sorry, the 644 was what we built between 2019 and 2022. And that was based on the resources that were available to us in the previous investment plan. When we're planning our own target for the city of Edmonton, we look at the resources that we have available and the priorities that council has set for us and we set targets below that. Um, so we part of that investment plan update will be looking at what that number for supportive housing should be uh, over the next few years. Um, but there's also an, uh, in the next through the corporate homeless, or sorry, the community homelessness plan, there's also going to be a look at that overall supportive housing need in general and a refresh of what the overall target should be for the community as a whole. Because we kind of have, there's two levels we're operating on. One is wanting to articulate what's the need in the community overall, um, in the city overall, and then what portion of that need is the city in a position to take the lead on ensuring gets met, if that makes sense. So, um, yes. so we, Look at both, and we'll, there'll be more to come on both of that through the updated investment plan and also through the uh, community plan to end homelessness. And so, so that's demonstrate to me this number could be changed. That only is is not a fixed number six hundred forty four. That's correct. That was the number we did last four years over the last four years. So we'll be doing more in the future. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So my last question is about the resources, and because right now the resources is city investments already provided the $133 million to leverage other uh, level of government funding. Um, based on the investment we already provided, how much, how many targets and among 2,807, this target already achieved? And because that first uh, strategy and is between 2000, uh, 2016 to 2026, and we still have two years to there, or 2025. So I, I want to know and how many um, we already achieved as a target, and then what is the gap there? We still need more resources or more investment to achieve that target. 
Okay, <laughs> so that's a good question again. Um, so the, I think the data that you're referencing, Council Rice, is for the last budget cycle. Uh, yes. So we had 133 million that we leveraged to create the 28 and some units. Um, yes. For this budget cycle, we've set a target of 2,700, which is based on the funding available to us, which um, at the time of the budget, we had put forward an investment plan of around 200 million requests, and it wasn't totally funded, but, but it has been subsequently added to since. So where we're at right now is around, I think, I don't want to totally misspeak in case someone's on finance too, they might know better, but it's about 170 million of that 200. Um, so that's why we're going to, now that we have that clarity, we're going to update the investment plan to, to confirm that target, if, whether that 2,700 unit okay, target sorry, is correct. Sorry to cut you off. Oh, yeah, no worries. Over, over time. Sorry about <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, we're just going to do a little bit of time management here and uh, try to be quick with our questions because we still have another item to get to with a speaker. Uh, so next I'll go to Councillor Tang. Please go ahead. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, just want to commend your work. Uh, it's a very strong report, and I have to say I was uh, very glad to see how so much of the lived experience research has shown up and it was woven through. And uh, I have a lot of questions, and some of which I might just email you because it's more of clarifying uh, some of the numbers for me, but I'll just focus my question around homelessness prevention um, and the, the lived experience research. Um, I guess I am... I'm, I'm curious, it's been over a year since the needs assessment was published uh, and where we heard some very um, uh, you know, personal stories being shared in this room. And I guess I'm wondering in the past year, have you, um, how has the team be, been deepening, learning, exploring some of those opportunity areas that the research has surfaced? Um, I do see them, I do see them referenced. And I guess I'm just wondering a little bit about what's the plan um, moving forward, how are you going to action it? Um, are you going to be looking at, you know, best practices like SOLAS that we just heard? Because we have some excellent starting point. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I think that what we've realized is that there's um, a need to find a way or a mechanism to continue to engage people with lived experience. Um, we've learned that there's a number of different uh, actors, for example, um, post-secondaries who are also beginning to engage in this space around uh, engagement with people with lived experience, particularly in encampments. And so I think a part of our role is to, is to figure out how we might align and coordinate those efforts. And the other part of our role is to make sure that we can find a way to do this in a way that um, um, is, is dignified, but also doesn't take up um, and unduly burden folks who are, who are living in encampments or unsheltered homelessness. Mm -hmm. And I would just add to that that we did all, we also used the research through the housing needs assessment to um, develop a few encampment prototypes related to uh, different folks who might be unsheltered, and that we're in the process of evaluating those prototypes right now. You heard from two of the speakers uh, who were, were Solas. That was one of the four prototypes from the encampments, uh, and so we'll have more information on the results of that uh, in the next few months as well. Yeah, because I see lots of potential there for mm -hmm. advancing you know, the goals, number two, and even number three, do you see any opportunities there through storytelling, through connecting these stories and qualitative data of, uh, between those who are sharing the stories and the members of the public to, to, br to build some bridges in, in understanding? Yeah, I think, I think there is potential to do that. I mean, we heard from, um, you know, Ms. Shepley, or Cunningham Shepley from the EF EFCL who asked, who talked about uh, neighbors wanting to engage and learn more about um, how they can be inclusive and incorporate uh, housing into their communities. There is a CSWB grant that the city provided for a project in Highlands that's looking at um, welcoming new residents into their neighborhoods. And I think the combo of the data with the story is a really powerful way to help um, all you know, all Edmontonians understand why affordable housing is a is a vital is an important solution, and why um, inclusion is also a really important part of that solution. Yeah, because I you know I I know your team has done some excellent marketing campaigns in the past, and I think I'm thinking beyond just marketing. I think it's really about building relationships, like we've heard, and that's really vital. Um, in in the in the uh, I think this is on page 18 of attachment one. You talk a lot about segments. This is a piece that came out of directly from the lived experience research. You know the population who are needing affordable housing isn't a monolith. There's different experiences. I think we talked about priority groups, but those are often along identity lines. How do you plan on I guess leveraging the lessons learned in the, in these segments of different experiences and motivations? 
Well, I would say some of that has shown up in the tactics that are here already. Like, for example, one of the things that we heard a lot was um, from certain segments is just it's difficult to navigate the system in general, right? And so having, you know, and having your name on multiple wait lists from multiple organizations uh, can be a challenge in terms of staying on top of that and, and being able to, um, you know, have up-to-date, accurate information about where you are in the housing process. And so, for example, like I would say one example uh, that we incorporated from that is that tactic. But <clears throat> going forward, I think that there's, and I would ask, you know, Hani and Abdul, there's some other prototype ideas that have come from that segmentation research that we're looking at and that are sort of part of um, the other tactics. So maybe I'll let Abdul or Hani speak to that. Sure. So yeah, we're working with with um, Recava to um, prototype some of the learnings we have learned from the lived, lived experiences. And we, we will be working with priority groups in ensuring that we, we, we update this continuously after every two years for the housing needs assessment to be more up, up to date. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Stevenson, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I also want to start by commending the excellent work that's been done. It's, a, it's really exciting to see this come together and really appreciate all the, all the great work that's gone into it. I appreciate uh, sort of the explicit statement of the city, you know, stepping up to be the systems planner for affordable housing. Uh, and just want to confirm that we're adequately, adequately resourced to, to play that role in terms of our current budget allocations. Yeah, I think so, uh, Councillor Stevenson. Like, you know, in general, the affordable housing space is one where more resources allows us to do more. <laughs> However, um, I think our team has done a really good job in the last few years of, you know, expanding to fill gaps that we've seen um, and working really closely with the sector to make sure that uh, their top concerns are escalated to, um, you know, council and other orders of government, right? And so, you know, one example of that is I think the community tax grant, or the municipal uh, property tax grant piece, which we, uh, you know, really were responding to the sector on. Uh, that wasn't necessarily something that we went out expect, or, you know, planning to do, but just hearing the overwhelming input um, from the sector around how important something like that would be to them uh, is, you know, and then being able to develop a solution to that, I think that's a good example of our capacity there. Great, great, and not, not in terms of skill, but just like we've got the staff that we're not, yeah, perfect, that's, that's excellent. Um, great that we're gonna be seeing an updated investment strategy. Two things come to mind, just in terms of, you know, the, the medium term goals we have for the number of units. Again, does the budget commitment that we've made so far, is that roughly in line uh, in terms of what we need to meet those, those medium term objectives? So we have to balance a few things. <laughs> you know, one is um, I think the first plan that was put forward around the 2700 had a $200 million commitment, and that hasn't necessarily been fully funded yet. Um, most of it is in place. I, my team just got the number was in between here, and it's about $160 million. Uh, uh, so we'll be looking at the resources that we have, and then we'll also be looking at the strategy. And, you know, one of the things is the strategy does ask us to prioritize you know, housing for those most in need, and often those solutions are the more expensive solutions, right? So these are the things that we have to balance when it comes to that target. It's not just about the overall number of units, it's the type of units that we're getting as well. Okay, and then another big shift that I'm mindful of is the increase in interest rates. So in terms of that investment plan, looking at AHIP, recognizing that organizations may not be able to leverage mortgages for as much of the project costs in the past, is that that will also be taken into consideration? Yes, <laughs> unfortunately, okay. yeah, yes, Great. unfortunately. <laughs> Great. Great, well I think, um, I have so many questions, but maybe it mentions an annual report card. Will there also be an annual report to council on progress? Yeah, the intent that is that the report card would be public and shared with council, of course, as well. Okay, and then, um, Really quickly, it's, it speaks about targeted seed funding to support technical capacity of different organizations. I think that's really positive in some ways. I also worry, I think what we've seen in the past is maybe like every organization becoming a housing provider and that can lead to some, some system inefficiencies as well. Just wondering how you're balancing that in terms of 
That is a great question. <laughs> um, and we are very alive to that. And, and the way that we engage with the providers, I think, reflects that. So, you know, we when we hear about a housing need or someone wanting to solve a housing need, we first look to see, you know, are there other organizations that might be well positioned? Uh, because we know it's, it's really difficult to hire for land development expertise, especially if you're a nonprofit. Uh, and so that's something that we, that's a conversation we always have, but there are certainly priority population gaps whose needs are not being filled by yeah. the housing providers that are currently exist. So where there's a strategic opportunity to support a group, like I think Nick and Ann a few years ago would have been a good example of that, yeah. right? Um, we do try to work with them in a different kind of above and beyond way to help uh, scale and build capacity where we can. Amazing, amazing, that sounds excellent. Then just in my last minute, so, I really appreciate the focus on homelessness prevention. And one, you know, again, the housing needs assessment is excellent. One question that I had lingering from that was that I wasn't necessarily clear um, sort of what other levers might be available. So folks who are experiencing low and very low income, you know, I'm curious where where is that income coming from? Um, is that another area where changes could be made. So instead of having to build this many units, if we changed this many people's income by a certain amount, uh, then, we're, then we're resolving the problem. Is that additional information that could be gathered? Yes, we could gather that information. And I think that's an important part of the global conversation around housing, for sure. Um, someone mentioned Finland earlier today. And I think, and you know, one of the parts of that story is that, you know, 25% of the population there has access to a universal rent subsidy mm -hmm. program, right? So um, I think looking at the set, we can see what we have in terms of census data and also certainly supplement that with information from the providers that we work with. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, this is something I've been long waiting for. I, I do agree though uh, with a few of the speakers. While I'm, I'm overall supportive, I do have a few caveats. And I think uh, Speaker Noble said it well that I think what I'm grappling with is the, the ambitiousness of this goal. So I just did some quick math of our strategy and the way I calculate our targets based on what our current core housing need is today and what our target is, we're hitting about 5.8% of the target for the core housing need. And at the rate of building every two years at that percentage point will take us 40 years, which is beyond 2050. So to me, the problem with that is a strategy, the strategy is already fallible and that's not accounting for that number of core housing need changing in any way. And we know and we're seeing that that is actually happening. So I'm, I'm struggling to support a strategy that is already fallible from the start. Can you please help me here to understand how this is what we're working with and how, how do we actually get something that's gonna get people out of core housing need? Sure, so there's, I, I think there's probably two points to that, uh, Councillor Rutherford. The first is that um, the target that we have set reflects the resources that have been provided to us. So, um, you know, that's that's ultimately what we set our target based on. <laughs> but then the second part of that story is that this, the city of Edmonton isn't the only funder of affordable housing in, in Edmonton, and it can't be the only funder of housing in Edmonton if we want to have a hope of um, meeting the targets or, or filling the need. And so one of the things that we've been talking about in our team is looking at setting community-wide annual targets, whether that be like, you know, a five-year target or an annual for what progress we'd like to see overall in Edmonton in terms of new housing or how many units would need to be built to meet it in a way that aligns with the target. Um, and that's some work that we're hoping to, to take on later this year. Yeah, like when I read the report on page 18, for example, it talks about that you're forecasting between 1,400 and 1,700 units of supportive housing is needed. Um, and that would be, I would contend today, not in 2050, but today, correct? Yeah, I don't know, Abdul, do you want to speak to, we do, we do factor in some um, future projections into it, but it, you know, it's obviously difficult to know exact, uh, to, to project things like supportive housing demand, but maybe I'll let it Well, I mean, in the report it also says, and I quote, the number of people follow, falling into homelessness exceeds the capacity of the serving system, causing a bottleneck effect that is increasing length of time that a person experiencing homelessness will wait to get help through a Housing First program. That is accurate, and that will increase that need for supportive housing for sure, but I'll let maybe Abdul do you want to speak to how we've um, projected future demand yeah. in here. Yeah, so that's, that's correct, uh, the councillor. Uh, the 1700 need is based on, is for by 2026. 
and it's based on current inflows and outflows into the homelessness. So we want to get that by 2026. Six, yes. Okay, but this is the other thing. So then, but we can't do supportive housing without the province. Like this is what people are not understanding. Supportive housing is a great example of like, we 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 had examples. We built supportive housing and ha and they sat waiting, and we were worried we weren't going to get provincial funding. Then luckily we did get that funding. But are, is that the strategy we're going to take again? Like build it and hope for provincial funding, or I guess like this is what I, I think people, the public generally doesn't understand is like we can create this strategy, but we can't build supportive housing. We can't, we don't have the operational dollar capacity for that element. We, the rent geared towards uh, or the, the affordable housing uh, that's geared towards rent, um, rent geared towards income, I think is a space we play. So is that coming with the corporate strategy? Because that's what I'm also losing sight of is like, there's so many other strategies that are coming forward. Our investment strategy, the corporate strategy, the community strategy. And so it's the sequencing is hard for me when we're approving this today or at council, at the next council meeting. And then I'm hearing that, well, those numbers could change depending on what our investment strategy says. And these numbers could change based on what the community plan says. So this is where I'm really struggling. Sure, so I think what you see in the housing needs, needs assessment today is the reflection of what's needed in Edmonton, you yeah. know, uh, essentially as soon as possible, like obviously by 2050, because that will meet our goal, yeah. but people are in housing need now, so the more that we can bring on, the better. Uh, what you see in the investment plan is what the city can, can support within those broader targets. Okay, and so when you come back with the investment strategy, will administration be bold in their ask of what they actually need financially? I think administration will give council the information needed <laughs> to know what's required to stay on track with its own targets. But the targets that are already not going to get us out of the situation we're in. We have our council approved targets from the city plan and so we can, we can bring you the information that's required to meet those targets and if you know if council wants to change those targets like that's council you know I, that's not my area. <laughs> thank you Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Salvatore. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for all the work that went into this report uh, and the strategy. So maybe just a point of clarification off the bat. So in the main report, uh, I see the table for target development out to 2050, um, each of the housing typologies, uh, including the gap in units and funding that would be required. So um, when the investment strategy comes back, is that where we're gonna get a finer grained understanding of what, what investments we should be making first, second, like sort of an, an order of priority? Yes, so we'll be bringing back, um, you know, here's the resources that we have for the next three years. This is the types of housing we're trying to achieve. These are the programs we're gonna use to achieve that type of housing, and this is how much money we're gonna allocate to those programs. Okay, um, well, we, at that time, will we also get um, an understanding of where we have shovel-ready projects across the housing spectrum? Um, and what, like what, type, what types of projects we can mm -hmm. um, be moving on sooner rather than later? I think we could include that, yeah. We, I mean, we track it internally all yeah. the time, yeah. Okay, yeah, I think that would be um, helpful, at least on my end. Um, I would just say it'd probably be like a roll-up, because sometimes projects are uh, right. just with not public of course, information of course, at, of course. at that point. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, and then, <sighs> So I'm hearing your team sets targets based on the resources allocated by council. I guess I'm wondering just about the, the directionality of that. And I'm gonna draw a comparison to our energy transition strategy where we, we have really clear targets that we've set and then we almost work backwards and we say, okay, in order to achieve that, we need an annual investment of 300 million and that is spread across three orders of government, 100, 100, 100. Is it, is it possible to do something similar here? Is that where we're is that where we're going? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible for us to give you the information on what it would take to meet to stay on track to meet that target in terms of resources. Okay. Yeah, I I think that would be really valuable. Um, as I I mean, I totally understand the the idea behind obviously working within within the constraints that that council has provided um, but at least on our end as decision makers being able to understand like what that gap is between what we're able to invest or what we're willing to invest and what the ideal investment is in order to achieve the intended outcomes i think that would be that would be helpful um I'm just going to jump to land so it was mentioned that one of our main levers or primary levers is land 
Uh, I know we recently did a review of the surplus school site policy in order to provide a little bit more flexibility and hopefully some activation on, on those sites. Um, any additional thoughts or things we could push on there around uh, accelerating that process? I think there's certainly more to come on that <laughs> I mean, in some of the future work that was referenced as, um, and obviously, you know, around the Housing Accelerator Fund, this, our team worked with um, UPE to look at all, at all types of strategies because a lot of the uh, sort of low-hanging fruit from, that might be available to other cities isn't available to the city of Edmonton because we've already done it. So right. we have a number of thoughts on how housing supply could be accelerated, but a lot of that is in our action plan that's currently in discussion with the federal government and not public yet. Okay. Until it's approved. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, and maybe still, still on the land question, I'm also thinking about, you know, if we know that a site can't necessarily be uh, built on for like a year, two years, X number of years, um, opportunities for like short-term leases where some creative ideas could be tested, any, anything in that realm? We always look at that <laughs> for what it's worth. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times practically it just doesn't make financial sense because, and we have some examples of this. We have, you know, a housing development that's closed down where there's still houses on it. Mm. We've looked at whether those could be reactivated in the short term, even though it's set for redevelopment. But unfortunately, often the, the money involved in bringing the asset up to the condition that's needed to be able to be occupiable again is it doesn't make sense if we're going to just tear it down in a couple years so that's that's often the barrier but we're always looking at that even some of the sites we've acquired for housing we look at in the short term if there's a way to meet the needs of people experiencing houselessness yeah. that's something we look at too um, but unfortunately just you know if you sometimes when you buy a site for housing it's not the best suited for another per related even if it's a related purpose and so there's some barriers there but we always look at that Okay, that's great to hear. So no barriers in the way to, to do that right now. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Beyond yeah. the financial one, which of is, course. is a business case piece, right? Gotcha. Um, I am looking at my time, so I'll yield the rest of it. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. I do not see any more questions to administration, so I'd like to uh, give you our thanks. Thank you very much for the work you do, very important work. We really appreciate it. And thank you to all of our speakers, the work that you do, and for being here today. Uh, next, we, well, we do have a motion on the floor. Uh, it, would anyone like to speak to it? If so, I would ask you to please uh, speak to it quickly so that we can uh, complete the item today. Uh, Councillor Paquette, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and uh, I'll try to be quick, and I'll speak to this simply because I believe that orders are going to be extended. I won't be able to vote, so consider this my uh, verbal uh, agree agreement to all of these things. But um, uh, having a home it was, uh, I think, the theme that we heard today. Having, home, having a home also leads to being able to have a community. And so when we talk about homelessness and housing, what we're really talking about is building and strengthening the communities that make up our city. And we know that a lot of people in our community are being left behind. Um, and it's very tempting to blame people for their own misfortune, to say, well, and there are people who have had tough times. Everyone has had tough times, everyone suffers. And some people who pick themselves up or have a community to help them get out, sometimes they forget the, the compassion part. They say, well, I, I fixed myself. I got out of this. I got out of my addiction or I found a home or I got a job. Well, that's great. That should be something that we celebrate, but not used as a tool to then disparage others who are still working on it or others who will never be able to fix the issues in their lives. If at the city we had the budget, I, I think I, I heard uh, a request for 40,000 homes. That would be about $8 billion. Uh, and uh, that's bigger, <laughs> like that's, that's the size of our entire capital budget. So everything we build, it would be the exact same size. The, the tax implication for property tax uh, is very, very large and would also blow away our ability to, to borrow anything for capital reasons in an emergency. The reason we're in this 
uh, type of constraint is because we are simply a municipality with property taxes and our role is essentially city roles. According to the constitution and the province's own legislation and what is accepted across Canada, provinces are primarily responsible for housing. What a municipality can do and what we do do is convene, we enable, we encourage, we lobby, we advocate, and we even throw our own dollars into it. A lot of dollars. To date, uh, since uh, our last report, uh, over $250 million just on this effort alone, which is huge. There's been a lot of talk uh, lately about housing, about shelters, about all those things, and uh, it hasn't always been constructive talk, especially when it's volleys fired back and forth in media and groups arguing with other groups, when really we all have the same goal, or we should have the same goal. And if someone doesn't have that goal, I'd love to hear the reason why. And that is to help people get off the streets, to help them with supports, to help others to just get on with their life and all they need is that, that little bit of space where they can get things together, which is what we're talking about today. I also wanna thank administration for uh, all the work they do on this. It is heartfelt work. It is never ending work. It is work that never has enough resources or time. And I know for a fact that the folks who are working on this, uh, not just in our administration, but in our entire community, sometimes have trouble sleeping, sometimes wake up and feel a bit of despair. And once in a while, there's that glimmer of hope. So it takes an enormous amount of personal strength to do this work, especially when there is actually so little support. And so, uh, all I can say is that uh, on the council side, we support this effort wholeheartedly. I think I can't speak for my colleagues, but I know their hearts on, on this one. And uh, we just hope that all levels of government will come to the table in a good way and that we come to a table in a good way and all of our helping organizations and all the people who are informed and need to be in this conversation, we all come together in a good way to solve this because it can be solved Will we always have homeless people? Yeah, sure. But we can virtually solve this uh, to a large degree if that, all of that effort and, co and cooperation is there. Thank you. Thank you. Amir, so we to close. Uh, you know, Councillor uh, Piquet uh, articulates these, uh, uh, I would say, on many Edmontonians' behalf, these issues so eloquently that I can't add more other than uh, uh, stress what he has said, uh, how critical this work is uh, for, for all of us and, uh, and deep appreciation to the work that administration has been uh, leading and deep appreciation uh, to, uh, to the community uh, that shared their views today. Uh, this is ongoing work. Uh, uh, we, are a, we are on a journey uh, and, uh, and uh, that journey had its own ups and downs and bumps, but I think we're all committed to, uh, to building an Edmonton for everyone. And you can't have Edmonton for everyone if people don't have access to housing. Housing is so critical for building healthy people, healthy communities and healthy, uh, uh, you know, uh, healthy communities uh, in, uh, in every aspect, right? So this is a very important work and uh, Look forward to further conversation on this. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Thank you. Uh, and now I would like to um, make a motion to extend orders. Uh, is the committee okay to extend till one o'clock? 
hopefully to complete the agenda. Yes. I don't know if that's a vote or not, but yes. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, Councillor Rice? Uh, yes. Thank I, I can't stay, but uh, I do have a motion. Maybe someone else can make that motion. I can share that with you. I can make it. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Okay, so I'll ask my colleagues to vote on extending orders uh, until one o'clock. We may finish before that, but I'll just have you vote on that, please. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Okay, so we'll go on now to item 7.2. Uh, sorry, Madam Chair, do you, would you like to do the subsequence now? Oh, sorry, Councillor Knack. Yes, that is where we are at. <laughs> yes, please go ahead, do the subsequent, Councillor Knack. Yes, thank you. Uh, I've got, sorry, one, uh, two, uh, one on behalf of Councillor Tang, and there's the wording that administration revisit past research and opportunity er areas tailored towards segments of uh, segment, segments surfaced through the affordable housing needs assessment, qualitative lived experience research, attachment to the September 26, 2022 Community Services Report, CS01088, and determine paths for action directly involving people with lived and living experiences included but not limited to advocacy, prototyping, service adjustment, and coordination. Um, I, I recognize that a lot of the, some of this, or well, this motion would sort of be led in the, based on some of the questions that were being asked earlier, so I don't need to spend a lot of time on it um, and, and happy to um, just sort of move into the debate. Uh, and I'm doing this on behalf of Councillor Tang. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Does anyone have any questions for Councillor Knack? It does not appear so. Uh, Councillor Knack, would you like to close on this item, on this subsequent motion? Nope, that's motion? fine. We can just keep moving. Thank you. You can, yes, yes. Uh, Councillor Tang does, would like to speak to it. Then. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Councillor Knack, for, um, for moving this this um, subsequent motion and I appreciate administra administration saying just an extra minute to um, accommodate this, uh, this motion. Um, I, you know, I think this has been a really excellent report. I think the only thing that I have been unclear on is how are we moving forward uh, with some, I think really interesting ideas that came out of uh, the opportunity areas. Um, I, you know, I think there will be no shortage of conversations when it comes to concrete numbers and goals and how many more units, and I think we need all of that. And I just very much want to amplify the, you know, the voices and the findings from the qualitative lived experience research that has been woven throughout the strategy. I see that, I recognize that, and I just maybe want to maybe flag a few principles here that, um, that I'm, I'm hoping to accomplish and through, and maybe I just outline some intent here with, uh, with this motion. Um, we have, city has lots and lots of great uh, research working with people with lived experiences, working with neighbors. So there are so many um, opportunities I feel like we haven't even really tapped into. Um, and so I, one, I will like, us to revisit some of them. Um, uh, and I hope the team doesn't kind of take this at face value. I think it's really important to kind of go back uh, and work with people, talk to folks, uh, involve them. I hear the comment around we don't want to overburden uh, folks who are living precariously, but I will also encourage the team to consider, to creatively consider potential opportunities here, even for, in, let's say, employment with people with lived experiences to reimagine uh, the next iterations of community service delivery and co-creation. Um, I just think throughout this entire conversation, um, which has been really, really great, really strong, but I really want to make sure that the folks who are going to be impacted by this policy are, will remain um, very central to this conversation. Um, and not just remaining in the sense that we've done a survey or we've done interviews, but very much involved um, in some of the co-creation 
Um, there's lots of ideas here. You know, one that really stood out to me, for example, is this mobile homicary um, for people who may be living in their cars or who may not, it's not even necessary, you know, there's lots of different experiences um, characterized not just by people's identity, it is characterized by people's um, lived experience. And I think that, you know, the administration has highlighted segments is really important. Um, and I hope we can leverage some of those research around segmentation uh, to build and tailor solutions to specific motivations um, and experiences. So I, I guess I'm just kind of, when I was looking through some of the opportunity areas, I also saw even opportunities for maybe different kinds of advocacy conversations we could be having that's not just about money, but about how, do, how does the province perhaps, um, uh, you know, use some of their resource to support people coming out of, I don't know, in, in incarceration. So I, so I think those are those kinds of opportunity as well that I hope we can kind of take a look at. And in terms of, in terms of the timing, this will be 13 weeks um, and there's lots of other checkpoints coming up and I hope this work will also inform uh, the corporate and community plans for ending homelessness. Um, and I, you know, I hear administration is welcome um, of this work and, and I appreciate your openness um, and I look forward to hearing how the community will continue to be involved in this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Knack, to close. Uh, no, nothing further, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack, please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Councillor Knack, I'll go to you again. Yes, just pulling up the wording for the second one. There it is. Uh, that's administration supplement the updated housing needs assessment attachment four with a further breakdown of low and very low income Edmontonians, including but not limited to sources of income and affordable housing available to them. Thank you, Councillor Knack. And would you like to open or? No, no I get uh, Councillor Stevenson was asking questions about this. So I, I, if she wants to speak to it to close, I'm fine with that. But I, I think her questions were straightforward and it uh, looks like they were happy to do this. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. And I'll just clarify, I don't believe Councillor Stevenson is uh, online. So uh, I will just ask if anyone else has any questions. Councillor Rutherford, please go ahead. I guess just this isn't speaking to whether this is this is a memo that would then come to council right with that update yeah we could use that as a vehicle okay I just was noticing the the motion doesn't really is kind of silent to the the form of of circling back so councillor knack I don't know if you want to just uh, add memo or something? Yes, in there? I believe memo was. Uh, I think uh, Councillor Stevenson's desire was to have some type of uh, information coming back to to council at some point, but it could be a memo and then included with a future update. I believe was what, what I heard from. And pri so, could we say and could we add? Would it be friendly to say uh, and provide it in the form of a memo at the end of that, or and and and. Or maybe anyway, if you don't think it's if it's clear to administration, I don't need to like an angle it. It's just wanted to make sure that we always kind of have that. Where is this going? No, it's a fair point. Uh, Chair Principe, we have added updated wording to the motion on the screen. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. So it is in order. Then it is in line and official. Okay. Yes, great. that motion's in order. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Knack, would you like to close? No, thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Okay, now we'll go to item 7.2. Thank you.
So <clears throat> good afternoon. Um, the city's turf and horticulture teams work hard to care for uh, our publicly maintained green infrastructure. Through turf activities like mowing and trimming and horticulture tasks such as maintaining shrub beds and annual flower planting, these teams ensure the green spaces can be enjoyed by all Edmontonians. We're here today to speak uh, to speak of the work of administration has done uh, in reviewing the, re and the resourcing and service levels for both turf and horticulture programs in Parks and Roads uh, services. With me today is Craig McEwen, the branch manager of Parks and Road Services, and Mark Beer, Director of Infrastructure Operations, as well as Travis Kennedy, General Supervisor of Open Space Operations, and Nicole Fraser, General Supervisor of Operations Planning and Monitoring, are online with us today. Along with representatives from Integrated Infrastructure Services and Urban Planning and Economy, uh, and I will pass it over to Craig to do the remainder of the presentation. Next slide. I'll start by saying, thanks Eddie, the, uh, the amount of complaints and inquiries on turf and horticulture have dramatically decreased over the last week, um, which is a positive sign. Uh, the turf and horticulture programs play a crucial role in enhancing uh, community vibrancy by providing safe and attractive and well-maintained outdoor green spaces. Uh, this provides opportunities for outdoor recreation and activity. Uh, which is aligned uh, with the city plan and uh, uh, the city plan goal of a healthy city. So the city maintains uh, over 4,000 hectares of turf and about 2 million uh, meters squared of shrub beds. And so what that is is about 5,000 CFL football fields of grass uh, and about 250 football fields worth of shrubs, uh, that shrub beds that need gardening. Uh, so that's a lot. So through regular feedback received from Edmontonians, we know that parks, sport fields, uh, green spaces are an important service, and that administration considers this to be a core service. Uh, however, with the current resourcing, we're not able to meet our current service level targets uh, or industry best practices in terms of uh, plant health care. So in attachment two of the report, you can see that uh, we've got a report card for our performance results over the last summer season. This shows how our programs are performing compared to our targeted service levels. Uh, so what we're seeing with our current inventory budget and resourcing is that our teams are unable to meet those targeted service levels. Uh, in general, turf is accomplishing about 80% of the targeted service levels, whereas the horticulture is under 55%. Um, there are two areas where we are able to meet the quantitative uh, service level, and that's the frequency uh, in which horticulture shrub beds are serviced. Uh, that said, we are not meeting the quality of service. So our horticulture teams have adjusted maintenance practices, moved away from industry standard in terms of um, visiting shrub beds, uh, sorry, in an effort to visit shrub beds equitably across the city. Uh, but instead of removing weeds from the root, our teams are uh, weed whacking taller weeds uh, and leaving the ve uh, fallen vegetation behind. Um, uh, we also see uh, visible grass clippings left behind when mowing, uh, and this is to the, uh, due to reduce, reduce frequency of mowing cycles. Next slide. So since 2019, the turf and horticulture asset inventories have both grown. Turf's grown by about 5% and horticulture by almost 20%. So during the same time, although the inventory uh, we're responsible for maintaining has increased, our operational budgets uh, have decreased. The turf budget has decreased by a little over 9% and the horticulture uh, budgets decreased by about 12. So budget reductions are a result of initiatives by council and administration to reduce operating budgets through a variety of previous cost-saving initiatives. Uh, additionally, the time it takes to complete both horticulture shrub bed maintenance and turf mowing has increased uh, and, the, uh, and the tools available to do the work have changed. So back in 2015, council approved a herbicide ban on city lands, uh, except where they're used to eradicate noxious weeds as defined by provincial noxious weed lists. Uh, as well as other exemptions to protect critical infrastructure. Manual weeding takes more time than herbicide spraying, uh, resulting in reduced productivity when it comes to weed control. As a result of the herbicide ban, the reduced service level implemented in the spring of 2020 associated with COVID budget reductions, uh, regulated weeds are now proliferating uh, in shrub beds in neighborhoods along roadways and in parks. For the turf inventory, the time it takes to mow and trim has increased as overall landscape designs have become more complex. Uh, so park assets are being installed, trees are being planted, all of which are good things, uh, but when crews uh, now need to open, or m where they could have mowed open fields with larger mowing equipment, uh, they now have to spend more time mowing, uh, smaller machinery, and more objects to trim around. 
Uh, so it's worth noting that over the last five years, administration has implemented a number of improvements in efforts to enhance efficiencies and service delivery with the available resources. And some of those examples include uh, improved operational routing and mapping systems, uh, including working with frontline employees and gathering their feedback, uh, created detailed tracking and measuring systems for completion of infield work. We've increased our public communications and awareness of service levels. Uh, scripts for 311 have been updated using internal web maps uh, and enable staff to respond to higher levels of inquiries uh, more accurately and quickly. We've also provided educational webinars to homeowner associations and community organizations who are interested uh, in increased service levels and entering into agreements which allow them to perform enhanced maintenance on city lands. This next slide. Uh, a part of this report, we've completed a jurisdictional scan that compares the city of Edmonton to other municipalities of similar size and climate. And so some of those key findings are uh, there's not really a set standard of classification and prioritization of inventory assets across cities. Our targeted turf mowing uh, for high priority areas like sports fields is similar to other cities. Line trimming or weed whacking occurs less frequently than just about all other municipalities. And most of our horticulture shrub bed maintenance occurs less frequently than other cities as well. Uh, so ad administrations used a yardstick benchmarking to compare program costs and found that Edmonton's operating expenditures based on allocated budget per turf hectare and horticulture meter squared uh, are lower than most other Western city municipalities uh, who participated in that yardstick benchmarking analysis. Next slide. Uh, so in regards to next steps, we know Edmontonians uh, turf and horticulture asset inventory will continue to grow. Edmontonians will continue to look for more opportunities for outdoor recreation and beautification. Additionally, administration often receives questions from Edmontonians, visitors to Edmonton, uh, and council about higher turf and horticulture service levels uh, from neighboring communities as well. Uh, if there's no changes to current funding and resourcing, administration will conduct a service review project, uh, and the aim of that will strategically adjust our service levels to align with our existing budget. Uh, so while planning for continued future growth. So really what we'd be doing is aligning our service levels and our expectations to the budget. Administration estimates that this review will take about a year uh, and we'd be implemented in the summer of 2025. Uh, so this approach would work to meet current funding available by reprioritizing re and reclassifying inventory, changing and reducing service levels. Uh, so really that could mean that some sites may be serviced more uh, while others uh, would have a longer duration between maintenance cycles. And some sites might even be decommissioned or not serviced at all, uh, depending on new classifications, which is something we'd explore. Uh, we'd also explore opportunities to leverage tree planting and naturalization to support conversion of existing inventory uh, that would no longer be maintained uh, as uh, mowed grass or ornamental uh, shrub beds. Uh, next slide, last slide. Uh, so on table on the table in, pa in um, sorry the table on page two of the attachment four uh, of this report shows the annual operating budget increases uh, that would be required for a series of proposed options. Uh, uh, from meeting uh, our current service levels as well as, as well as potentially increasing maintenance cycles uh, for the current inventory. For a scenario where we were funded to meet current ser service levels, uh, one option would primarily use seasonal frontline staff uh, and another option would be to combine new funding with existing funding uh, for winter seasonal positions uh, and that could allow for the creation of 53 permanent positions as well. Uh, in regard to enhancements and increasing the frequency of maintenance, the options presented in option uh, in attachment four uh, include uh, more frequent line trimming or weed whacking uh, and more frequent visits to weeding uh, and weeding of horticulture beds and shrub beds. Uh, there's also quality standard uh, enhancement options, uh, which would see the horticulture teams returning to weed removal at the root rather than cutting uh, with a weed whacker. Uh, as well as formalizing shrub bed uh, mulching and pruning activities. The benefits to these enhanced quality standards would include uh, improved plant health, reduced weed growth, and uh, improved aesthetics. Better weed control also reduces the risk of inv invasive weeds that will spread uh, to private property or natural areas, uh, risking out uh, competing other plant species and reducing biodiversity. 
From an OP12 perspective, adequately funding these operations sh should see a potential investment in core services and would allow administration to meet current target service levels and quality standards uh, in the interim while working on a more fulsome uh, turf and horticulture service review. So that's the presentation and happy to field questions after speakers. Thank you very much for the presentation. Now I will call up on our speaker, Shannon Watson, to come forward, please. The clerk will guide you to your seat. <coughs> Hi there. Hi, you have five minutes, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Shannon Ross Watson. Thank you for allowing me to share perspectives and observations on the issues before us regarding horticulture and turf. I've read the literature attached to the agenda. The problems are very apparent and have not gone unnoticed. In case you assume I'm just a grumpy senior complaining about weeds, I have a vested interest. I was a landscape gardener for over 30 years and I worked in partnership with the City of Edmonton on three large horticulture projects, and some Edmonton school greening. <clears throat> in 2001, I was asked to take over and repair the perennial beds at the Mutart Conservatory that were part of the Alberta Perennial Trials. This was a partnership with the City of Edmonton Community Services, Partners in Parks, Lanta, Alberta Agriculture, and other sponsors. I stepped in as a volunteer and worked on this project until 2008 when the area was demolished for the new LRT Valley Line. In 2005, I was hired to take over and restore the extensive green roof at the City of Edmonton Waste Management Plant Research Facility. The roof had been receded twice and was dying again. There were many challenges, but overall it was a very interesting and informative project. I finished in 2007 when the project leader passed away suddenly and funding ended. And my favorite project in partnership with the City of Edmonton was the establishment of the Community Garden Network, now called Food Security Edmonton. Incorporated in 2003, we created ongoing support and funding and tremendous growth in numbers of community gardens. All these projects were held to the standards of best horticulture practices. So the reason I'm here, I was asked by Councillor Rutherford if I would like to attend after a series of emails from me to her and to Stephanie A, Supervisor of Horticulture, regarding the poor maintenance of the shrub beds and turf around the Commonwealth Lawn Bowling Club in Coronation Park. So here are my observations and suggestions. It is clearly documented that the funding in place is not enough to allow turf and horticulture maintenance implement and carry out best horticulture practices. As the city has increased in size, so has the inventory to be maintained. Our city looks messy and unkempt, and it is not up to the standards of many other cities. Ignoring this problem is just making it worse every year. We are almost to the point where many large shrub beds and tree beds are beyond restoration. I'm thinking of the plantings on 137, 111, and 107 avenues. These large strips of established trees and shrubs are invaluable to keeping our city cool and green. Do you know that quack grass infesting these beds can grow an inch a day? Every time this plant is disturbed by the reciprocators or the weed whackers, it stimulates all the other buds on the stem. One quack grass plant can produce 500 feet of rhizomes and 206 roots. These beds and all the other weed infested beds need to be maintained properly and or specific herbicide treatment should be applied. Someone should crunch the numbers and determine the replacement costs of these large plantings. Discipline the developers and contractors who do not maintain newly created shrub beds in and around our city. Letting them sit not properly weeded for up to two years is not best practices. Encourage the developers and contractors to create simple shrub beds, medians and other plantings. Change the landscape design standards to simplify and save money. I'm thinking of those complicated LRT beds and those newly planted in Blatchford. Instead, keep it simple. A single tree, a bit of grass is just as beautiful and is easier to maintain. Stop using perennials in the mixes. With no maintenance for two years, these beds become ugly and infested with weeds because dormant seed in the soil 
is brought to life with the application of mulch and water. Add to the contracts with developers that corn gluten must be added to the soil to inhibit weed seed germination and to use good compost for mulch instead of bark chips. Enforce best practices. And finally, I need someone to add to the City of Edmonton logo the words, we are a winter city, to remind that all planning departments and developers that whatever is created, a new road, a median, an LRT station, a shrub bed, a new neighborhood, or a parking lot, there must be some accommodation for snow placement and removal. Parking lots do not need trees in their medians. Trees and cars and parking lots do not mix. There is nowhere to put the snow. Create plain, simple parking lots, trees on the side. And how about that new neighborhood, still water? Townhouses were created, each with a necessary tree, but there is no place to put the snow from the driveway and the sidewalks. It is piled on the tiny broken tree because residents are not allowed to put snow into the street. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but your time is up. Thank okay. you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, and I will just go to my colleagues and ask uh, if they have any questions for you. Councillor Rutherford, please go ahead. Uh, I'll first start by letting you finish your thoughts. It's oh, the last thing I just wanted to say is to simplify, maintain properly, and monitor. Mow the grass more often. Do not allow poor maintenance to continue or establish. Tree and shrub beds will soon need to be completely replaced. If you are going to use the word best practices in your documentation, and even when you post jobs for horticulture, then you actually have to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I was just wondering, again, you, you mentioned in your presentation that we've had some correspondence. Could, could you dive a little bit deeper into what you were specifically seeing? I think it, it articulates a bigger situation across the city, but could you uh, expand a little bit on what you we had corresponded about? Yes, well, um, I am not within, I don't live within your area, but I am the, um, on the board of the community guard of the um, Commonwealth Lawn Bowling Club, and I'm the gardener there, and I take care of all the grounds within the fence. But we were surrounded by thistles, and we were coming up to one of our major national tournaments, and I could not believe the poor care that has been happening through those beds. And it's been ongoing for about three or four years. And we actually are leaving the club and going to try and weed the beds around the club. So it costs us over $100,000 to try and keep that club going and to try and keep those greens in great shape and to keep all the weeds and seeds out of our area. But we can't do it if we are surrounded by shrub beds and turf that's not maintained properly. And so it began a series of letters. Um, I was anxious because the nationals were coming up. Nothing was being done. And uh, finally, they sent somebody in a hazmat suit as our gates opened for the nationals. And that person walked around and sprayed the weeds with Roundup. It wasn't a pretty sight. Yeah. And one of the things that I, I remember through the correspondence is learning is that this example, like there's even within the horticulture beds, I think what you and I both learned through the correspondence is that there's different sort of grades of service within that and so this one was supposed to be Top the, hi, the, tie, the high the highest, tier. The highest level is supposed to be around our club and it is definitely not the highest level according to their schedule. Yeah. But that's the problem is that you can't apply a schedule to every single bed and every single site. There needs to be perhaps some tweaking yeah. of those schedules. And there's a lot of things that you mentioned that are long-term in term, and the things that we've already discussed as a council around how we need to be designing differently. Uh, for example, how are we, when developers are building a new community, um, yes, they can build something better, but then do we have the capacity to maintain it? All of those conversations are happening, but in your expertise and your knowledge, 
what do you think would make the biggest, if, if you were to say to council today, what in your expertise would make the biggest impact immediately, what would that be? Mow the grass more often. So complaints come in because of dandelions. But the example that I showed, that quack grass grows an inch a day. If you cut the grass, it will thicken up and it will reduce the infestation of the dandelions. If you cut the grass, it will not produce seed that will infest the beds. Just cut the grass in a timely manner. It may not be the same on every site. Some grass goes faster in some areas than others. But if you keep the grass mowed, it will give us the look that we're a cleaner, tidier city than we look right now. Because right now it looks pretty messy. And they said that the mowers had to change because of... Yeah, but it's that's the thing you bring up too that I think is really important that I know is, is dear to my heart is, you know, we want to be a city where people are attracted to come to visit Edmonton, whether it's for sporting events or tourism. And so let alone have the community members feel that sense of pride in their own community. And so what I'm hearing from you, and so just make sure I'm, I'm, is that this would go a long way in creating that. It would, and it would also help the morale of the workers. The morale of the workers is very low when they can't do their job properly, and they're not allowed to at this time. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Do I have, uh, is there anyone else that has questions? don't believe so. Um, it doesn't appear that anyone else has any other questions for you. So thank you very much for uh, all the information. It was very informative. You can just have a seat back there and we'll invite administration forward. Does anyone have any questions of administration? Councillor Rutherford, please go ahead. Oh, sorry, Councillor Rice, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Would you like me to put Mayor's, uh, so his motion on floor uh, before I ask a question, or you want me to ask a question, then put motion. So is that proper timing to put the motion on the floor right now? Yes, you can put the motion on the floor. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you very much. So. Uh, I'm going to put the motion on the floor uh, on behalf of Mayor Sohi. So that community uh, and the public, I move that uh, community and the public services committee recommended to city council. There are two parts of motion. First one is that administration prepare a funded services package and the capital profile and for the spring 2024 supplement operating and capital budget adjustment to restore turf and horticulture funding to be able to deliver 2019 service level as described in the January 15, uh, 2024 city operation reports, CO02130. Um, part two is the administration prepare an unfunded service package and a capital profile for consideration during the full 2024 supplement operating and the capital budget adjustment to meet current service level and for turf and horticulture maintenance as described in the January 15th. 2024 city operation report CAO 02130. And there is a, a motion two there, and I will put after motion one. So we put motion one first. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Okay. Um, that's a motion. And then oh, I also have some questions. Yes, please go ahead. So is that a question, is this, uh, the time will restart it <laughs> for the five minutes? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, so uh, thank you for the uh, thank, thank administration and for the detailed uh, presentation and attachments. So the first question I have, uh, 
by reading uh, attachment to one specific for the inventory. So I do have uh, the question um, to administration, what is specific the top factors contribute to the inventory of turf and the hot culture increased compared to 2019? I can speak to in in general. It's just a growth of uh, of projects. Uh, so both developer led and uh, and a portion of city led projects, um, and just an increase in overall park space uh, for the city to maintain um, has grown over the last number of years. So is that is that related to the population increase as well? Yep. In in. In, uh, I I'm, I'm not sure if it'd be proportional to, but uh, it would be related to like growth in areas uh, across the city, yeah. Okay, um, so that means inventory increased, but our budget decreased. That's correct, yeah. Uh, so then go to the attachment five, and specific for the inquiries and from uh, our Edmontonians, and there is comparison. Uh, starting 2019 to 2023. Uh, specifically, what's the reason why and 2023's actually, actually inquires really lower uh, than other years and specifically from 2020? Is a significant decrease? Why is that? The think inquiry from item two. Yeah, there's there's um, there's quite a number of reasons that contribute to it. I would say, in large part, in 2020, um, the reduction, the dramatic d reduction in service levels uh, due to the COVID budget adjustments, um, it adjusted uh, both trimming and uh, and turf maintenance. So you'd see a spike in 2020. Um, but there's a number of factors. The amount of water and rain, uh, in, you know, contributes to the amount of, of growth. Um, I would highlight, though, that the, the turf inquiries, the large portion of those um, are related to trimming. So like the weed whacking around fence lines and posts and things like that uh, would be included in that turf. So the numbers within turf would include um, those that are about uh, weed whacking. Uh, the, I, look, I know these inquiries actually gr uh, grouped this three category. And the most increase in the past five years is the weight control. Can you explain a little bit of detail and why weight control and increased so much and from Edmontonian's inquiries? Yeah, I believe it's um, really increased just due to um, the year over year uh, uh, impact of the adjustment to the service levels. So by cutting weeds uh, year over year, uh, I believe that really spreads the amount of of, uh, of weeds in in, um, in horticulture beds or along the sides of the roads, and so without the tools that we described uh, in the presentation and the report, um, it's proliferated over time. Uh, so if uh, we restore the service level back to the 2019, uh, would you say all these inquiries and it could be reduced and specifically related to the weight control? Uh, yeah, I believe any sort of um, adjustment to our service level would see uh, a decrease to inquiries and complaints uh, related to that level of service. So uh, for sure, if we were to increase our level of service, uh, we would anticipate a, a decrease in, in complaints. Uh, based on the data provided by city administration, I do not worry about the turf and the hot culture culture and um, because if you look at the data is much much less and compared to uh, the 2019 but then if we restore the service level uh back to the 2019 level the only concern is about the weight control because the weight control almost like increased double and triple compared to 2021 so that is why i ask that specific question does that mean the weight control and the inquiry from our Edmontonians will reduce the base on this data if we restore the service level back to 2019. Are you asking a specific question there, Councillor Rice? Yeah, yeah, I did. And my time is out, and maybe come back and you can answer uh, next time. 
Councillor Rutherford, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, and th thank you to the mayor for putting this forward. I know over the weekend I was like, we can't lose turf in the, the other important conversations we're having. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to focus on the motion first and just understand that we'd be bringing a funded, so that means, yes, please make sure it's paid for. You can start planning now because it's funded. I mean, somebody can always unfund something, I guess, right? So maybe not, but funded um, to budget for restoring to 2019 levels. And then the second part of that is to then bring it up to our current standards, similar to what we talked about with snow. Is that, is that sort of the two part, my understanding of the two part motion, correct? But that one is unfunded. The second part is unfunded. So we would debate that one. I believe the, the first part is to uh, bring back to the 2019 funded levels, like the 2019 yep. budget. So I would, I would just want to be clear on funding to be able to deliver the 2019 service levels would be different than um, adjusting back to the 2019. That's, that's, the, that's what budget. I think that's why there's two parts to this. I'm just trying to understand the delta between the two. Well, maybe you don't know that off, off the top of your head. I don't, I'm seeing the edits take place, so I'd, I'd have, to, okay, I'd have no. to get clarity on what the intention is. But I, I would say the first portion, um, we would want to adjust that to, to deliver the enhanced service levels. Um, not, or sorry, to adjust to the budget, not, not to the 2019 service levels. So those would be two different things. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So that's, I just wanted to flag that to committee, maybe, in terms of the wording. Um, I, and I guess to Mr. Robar, is the f f spring budget sufficient time? Like, do we need to make a decision today or can this decision wait until the spring budget debate? Um, the, there would need, be, need to be time to hire, train, and implement staff. So if there was a funding decision today, we would be able to implement those changes for the beginning of the summer. If we were to wait until the spring SOBA, uh, probably six to eight weeks would likely be in the July time frame before yeah, the service Yeah, that's, that's what I was worried about. Because I know we had talked at um, the fall supplemental budget adjustment, and I had contemplated a motion on the specifically the trim um, component, and then decided to wait till this debate. But what I'm seeing is that's kind of bundled in with a bunch of other things that we'll debate down the road, but it doesn't, the, the, we need that those people in place sooner than the spring de debate is what I'm seeing. So, okay, I'm going to think about that one. Um, that's definitely a flag that I have um, on that. And then the other thing I really found very interesting was like the turf inventory increase seemed pretty standard, like com for the growth of the city. It's a little you know, when you think about a 3% population growth and some of the areas that we were increasing inventory, that seemed right. But 18.8% for horticulture inventory increase seemed quite substantive. Like, do we have a, a sense over time of how that horticulture, like, is, is it, has it been increasing at that percentage point or has there been a spike? What has changed? I think, I think the biggest thing to note is there's no max limit in any of our design standards. And so our, our colleagues in IAS and, and UPE are here to speak to more about that, but there's no limit in terms of how much horticulture, how, how complex that horticulture can be in our designs. And so I think that's kind of led to, let's build very beautiful things uh, yeah. that are complex and difficult to maintain. And so I, I'm not entirely sure beyond 2019. Like, um, pa like historically? Historically, yeah. but. But moving forward, that is something that we are looking at as a city, um, projects in flight and design standards to help rationalize this. I would, I would like, if, if it's possible to get any historical data on that, I would appreciate that. Uh, I think it's very important for me as some of the questions I've been pushing around the IIS side of things as well as the developer side of things. Um, I think I need to get a sense of is this unique are we, and if it is, what changed in our practices? Yeah, we'd be happy to send that in a memo or uh, get back to you on that for sure. Perfect, yeah. perfect. Um, yeah, thank you for, for shoring this up. And then I guess my other question, unrelated but related to turf, 
would you want me to do a subsequent on the brick thing that we've discussed in terms of bringing a report back on that? Brick maintenance, road, brick, crosswalks. I'm just for council prepping. So you don't have to answer now, I'm out of time. But if you could let me know uh, if that would be a subsequent that would be helpful to further that conversation because I know it's not coming back anytime soon. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, I don't see any other questions for administration. I'll just ask the question uh, if you do need any changes or any clarification on the motions. Um, we do have, uh, I would recommend, I guess maybe this is to our clerk team, yes. is the, is in the draft, the top portion that's been, I guess that's currently in red. Chair, Chair Principe, could we take a quick five minute recess? just to do some clarification with administration on the wording. Of the Certainly, motions. okay, we'll take a quick uh, five minute recess just to make clarification on the motion. Thank you very much.
Thank you. So we are back in public now and we are going to, I'm going to suggest that we postpone the rest of this meeting until the completion of the special city council meeting this afternoon so that we can get the uh, proper wording for our motion. Uh, and I will ask my colleagues to vote on postponing the meeting or do we need to vote on it or can I just postpone um, it? Committee can just postpone until after, or recess. Yes, make a motion to recess. Until okay, so after I'll make a motion to recess. Do we need a motion or can I just? A motion to recess um, until after the adjournment of the city council meeting. So moved. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. I'll ask my colleagues to vote, please. I'm, I'm a yes. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. All right, so we'll see you all back here after the uh, conclusion of the special city council meeting. Thank you. <laughs>